Welcome everyone to another Sunday, which means I'm here and we're changing water. Well, I'm not, but you probably are getting your tanks a little bit cleaner, a little bit better. And today I've got three tips for you. First, we got to start. Matt West in the chat has never had a taco in his life. That seems insane, but I just told him, you have a new goal in life. Try tacos. That's a, that's a dangerous place to be in because if you go have tacos from a place that doesn't have a good taco... You could decide you don't like tacos and the rest of your life would be taco free. I don't like it. All right. So do me a favor. Answer the poll that we have pinned in the chat if you're watching it live. My phone. My phone. It's like I fell on my keys. Vote for how many foods you keep and feed. And we'll use that data later. I'm going to use that as part of the three. And uh, I'll start in a different place. I was going to start with some foods and stuff, but... So then I'm going to start with temperatures or heaters. I have one of those right here. Remember when I ripped that box? It's not show quality anymore. Never going to be able to sign it and put it on eBay. But heating your fish makes one of the biggest differences you're going to see in your aquarium as far as fish looking good. Now, I already forgot my little preamble here, and that was these are the things that I've seen by talking to thousands and thousands of hobbyists, right? So when you say, that's not gonna work for me, my grandma lives in Antarctica and it gets too hot or too cold or whatever, in your specific situation, realize we're speaking to the other 99% that aren't in that specific weird zone. This is for everybody else going, oh yeah, that probably makes some sense. So when it comes to heating, most fish handle a wide, wide temperature band, right? You can look it up online. You can go and go, well, these come from where in the wild? How cold could that water get at the coldest? How hot could it get at the hottest? You could also look at, ooh, how removed from the wild are these? Like discus, pretty removed from the wild unless you're getting wild caught. What farm were they bred at? Are they in Thailand? Are they in Indonesia? Are they in India? Are they in Florida? Where are they getting bred? And what temperatures are they running? But in general, for all the other 99% of fish that don't have to be specific, changing the temperature will have a dramatic impact on the way your fish behave and result the way they look. Now, today we're talking about how to make your fish look good. You might go, but I don't care about fish. I want plants to look good. Great, that's a different video. This is specifically how to make fish look a lot better. Now, I'm a fish guy. I keep plants. I like plants too, but I'm fish first, plants second. If you're plants first, fish second, you're not going to like this video as much. But I love a good looking fish. So when it comes to heat, if we run them really hot, they might get into some breeding colors, right? We know that at 78 degrees, a lot of our fish will breed in our aquariums. But with so many of the fish we keep, we also get detrimental effects. Your angelfish are more aggressive. Your barbs are more aggressive. A lot of your fish, a lot of your male fish are harassing females nonstop. It's breeding time. And that breeding time is only supposed to happen once, maybe twice a year. And so when we run hotter temperatures in that band we're talking about, we have fish that are continually fired up and ready to breed all of the time. They're burning more calories. They're getting their fins nipped. They're getting chased. All of these stress factors. Now, if we lighten that load... Right, So maybe we take something from 78 to now we go to 74. We might be just out of that breeding zone, right? So we're not going to get quite that fired up color from the one male. But we're also not getting all the torn fins. We're not getting all the chased females, the losing of the weight, all of these things. And so what you find... As you ease off that temperature, a lot of times you will get the whole school of fish or all of the fish more colored up. Now, I keep my fish room, I physically heat it to about 74. 
my whole studio. And then the tanks run between 72 to 73 degrees, just on average. Depending on time of year in the summer, I don't run the AC as hot. They might hit 75, 76. But in the winter, they don't really get below 72-ish, unless the power's out, in which case they'll go down to 68 sometimes. Now, I still get fish breeding. They're not breeding all of the time. In general, I'm getting a little bit better color out of the fish. And what I really notice is we get more robust fish. So the females will pack on more weight, more eggs. They'll color up more. The males are also doing that. They're putting on body weight. They're coloring up more than just one because it's not in the breeding zone. You really see this in African cichlids and things like that where one dominant tank male will make everybody else, everyone else's life horrible because they want to be the flashiest want to breed. Same thing will happen in Danios and Rasboras and lots of fish. And so when we cool it down a little bit, it's not breeding zone time. Everyone gets a chance to really thrive. And so by doing the lowering of temperature, or at least at least knowing what you're doing, that's, that's really what this conversation is about, is like, are you intentionally keeping them right at the red line, right? Think of it as like the, the RPMs on your car. You know, you've got all the way to that red zone. Now, at 78 degrees for most of us, we're right outside that red zone. We're, you know, we're at, depending on the car, we're at 5,000 RPM or 6,000 RPM, right? Discus, more in that red zone. Okay, they're already in their, their red line and they're maxing it. We want to keep it at a nice, healthy, like, hey, at 3,500, the car is efficient. We're saving gas. Everything's going good. The car is not going to overheat. <clears throat> We've got a lot of room to work with. As a, as a, I should say another good point. If you're running it more at like 74, when you do get the heat spikes in from, you know, oh, my AC went out or it's really hot outside, you're going from 74 to 78 or 80 instead of 78 to 84, right? Now, this can be a little bit hard to battle because heat isn't only a heater. It's also equipment in the tank, right? And lights on the tank. And so all of these things play a part but I would encourage you to take one of your tanks and see what the differences are with changing the amount of temperature in that aquarium. And I, I, I realize, I apologize for everybody using centigrade. I don't know it off the top of my head. It's like, oh, that's gotta be 26, right? Lowering it down and observing it three to four weeks later and see some of the changes. Now take mental note, how active are they right now? Are they breeding? All of these things that we're, we're talking about. And try, you maybe even take a video, film it for 10 minutes, and then come back three or four weeks later. What does that tank look like? Is it behaving any different? There's probably new behaviors, whether you're gonna notice them or not, you might not notice them right away. But the temperature, I find one of the most key factors, especially if you want to breed fish or if you have aggressive species, right? And too often we set tanks to 78, we have success, that's fine, but it's not always optimal for every type of fish or every type of fish keeping. And I find when we slow down the metabolisms, we slow down the fighting, we slow down the breeding, all of those activities take a lot of energy, a lot of energy to produce eggs or to fertilize eggs or to chase the females or in some fish to hold those babies in their mouths for three weeks and not eat. All of those activities take energy and that energy is diverted from coloring up the fish, growing the fish, developing the fish, right? So those are all key things to making your fish look better is just giving them the time to flourish now, another key benefit, I think, you actually get a longer lifespan out of your fish. So live bears, rainbow fish, there's a lot of killies, there's a lot of fish that only live maybe up to three years. And a guppy kept at 80 degrees will produce a lot of babies and it will do it quickly, but it might only last 14 to 18 months. You cool it down, keep it at 70 or 72, you're gonna get more like three years on average. Right? There's always, 
I had a guppy that lived 27 years. And then the next one, my guppy died after six minutes. There's always going to be things that are a fluke. But on average, in totality, from a guy that's raised a lot of guppies and sold a lot of guppies, that's my recommendation on something like that. So, heating, very, very important. Uh, most of us that I've talked to, we, we are uh, set it at 78 and forget it. And I think if we're truly trying to optimize, we can't forget about these things. We need to go, okay, well, what is my my decision I've made with these fish. We kind of know a little bit that goldfish like cooler temperatures. We know that discus rams and epistos like hotter temperatures. But I find more and more people don't know that like, oh, Daniels want cooler temperatures? Shrimp want cooler temperatures? Plants want cooler temperatures? They don't know, they actually prefer it. Variatus, which is a type of, it's like a type of platy. They want cooler temperatures. A normal platy wants eh, a couple degrees more based on where they come from in the world. And so when you keep fish really kind of studying their climate and the temperatures they might prefer or not prefer helps get you that, oh, that's another 10, 15% of coloration, body shape, all of those things. So yeah, heat, very important. All right, next, I got a dry lip going on. 80 Fahrenheit is about 26 Celsius. Someone said it was 23.3 for 74 degrees. So hopefully those who are listening to this live stream or podcast can now go, okay. Now I've kept fish, one more thing, I've kept fish way below that. So just because a fish will live at 60 degrees doesn't mean they want to be there. You know, we do that when shipping, fish can get quite cold and things like that, or they might overwinter. That doesn't mean I'm getting the best coloration out of those fish. It just means they'll tolerate it. Just like they'll tolerate being at 84 degrees for a lot of fish for a couple of weeks, but they don't prefer it and they die out over, oh, six months later, it's not alive. Like it's hard on the organs and and stuff like that. So, you know, work towards what's that sweet spot. And we don't know the sweet spots for many of the fish. This is where you find people that specialize in, oh, I specialize in these rasboras. And theirs look great, way better than anybody else's. One of the tricks is they found exactly what temperature is important for them, right? All right, next we're going to talk about, keep filling out that poll, by the way. If you haven't, we only got 435 votes. We have 578 people. We can get more, more votes. All right, next we're going to talk about lighting. Lighting, so again, it produces heat. So there's something to know there. Lighting is what's going to make your eyes be able to see a good looking fish. When you look in, when you research lighting, I'm trying to think of the the easiest way to explain this. What light does, we cast a light. So think of like a flashlight, right? In complete black darkness, you could have an animal or a fish in front of you and your eyes cannot see it. You put a light on it. Now you can see it. But depending on what that light, what color, how strong, all of those things is how you will see the fish or the animal. So if I have a flashlight that's got a red bulb, it's going to look real weird and red. I can see it though. Same thing if it was green. Same thing if it's blue. Same thing if it's orange or yellow. I'm going to add a cast to it, a coloration to it. Now, in our aquariums, we might have fish that are red or blue or yellow or orange, right? <clears throat> and so depending on the light we shine on them is how they're going to look. Now, a lot of aquarium lights tend towards the blue spectrum. And why do they do that? They do that because blue is a very, very common color in people's aquariums, right? We have neon tetras, we have cardinal tetras, we have dwarf neon rainbows. That shiny blue color, very attractive to hobbyists. And so one of the easiest tricks in the book is to shine more blue on a blue fish. And guess what? It looks more blue. And then the average person goes, this light is so good. 
it makes my fish look good. My blue fish looks more blue. Pretty easy thing to do. And so that's why we get a lot of aquarium lights that are skewed towards blue lighting. Blue lighting also makes corals look better. So you've got, you know, if you take the, the hobby of freshwater and, and saltwater, saltwater is pretty dominated in corals. And you're making a light, you want that light to cover as much as you can. Even if it wasn't very bright and kind of was a low-end light, the fact that it kind of makes corals look better, that's a bonus. And so we get a lot of lights that have a lot of blue in them. For good reason, we got a lot of blue fish. Good for salt water. But what about all the other things like red plants, red fish, green plants, green fish, right? Oranges, yellows. We need full color spectrums on our lights. We want to accentuate everything. I want to see all the colors in a German blue ram. When you look at a German blue ram, yes, there's blue, but there's all the other colors in that fish as well. And if we, what kind of happens, I think, when you shine a lot of blue right on that part of the blue fish, that's right in your eye. Wow, really bright. But it mutes the other colors, right? And so, again, we know we're basically using a light, flashlight, and we're shining it on a fish. Do we only want to see the blue? I think we want to see all the colors. We want to see all, we want to see the whole dynamic range on that fish. It can be very apparent in rainbow fish or Achille fish or something like a Congo tetra where it's like a rainbow, right? We really want to see all of those colors. And so we want a light that produces lots of color spectrums and not weighted way too heavily in one area or another, unless we dramatically want that. You see that in flower horns, you see it in arowanas, like a red Asian arowana, you put red light on it, it looks even more red, same with flower horns, right? Same with cherry shrimp. These are, you know, tricks that are used. Um, you know, Phoenix used to make a light called the monster ray. And the monster ray really accentuated blues and reds. It was a fairly dim looking light, but it was made to accentuate those colors it was a fun light to use. We still have a few in the store, um, but it didn't make plants look very good. It didn't do anything for greens and lighter color, like a gold, like I say, a gold ram. Didn't look as good. It, it turned that yellow, that nice gold color into orange. And so it, it changed the way the fish, it's like using a filter on a camera or something. It, it changed the reality of it. And so... Um, you know, I would, if you want that extra popping blue, get something that's got some actinic lighting in it, that blue spectrum. If you want something that's really red, great, buy a red light. But if you're looking for, you know, a tr more true to nature, and that's what, you know, like our light, that's what I was going after, more true to nature. What is it, what does it look like when I'm in Peru and I'm watching sunlight come through the trees and hit tan and water, or if I'm in, you know, another wild waterway and there's not the tannins, what does that look like down there? What's the closest to that? I'm trying to replicate nature in my tanks. So that's where I went with my light. You want a high, you know, color rendering index. Hopefully it's going to, and, and a good spread of LEDs. And what that means is you have an option when you're, you're designing a light, you can design a light that will sell really well due to specs, or you can design a light that looks really good and you think other people enjoy. So I could have amped up red a lot. I could have amped up blue a lot. And that would, you know, cover those other segments we were talking about. It also makes red plants look better, right? And so if you're selling a planted tank light and you know people are going to have red plants and you shine red, that red flashlight into a red plant, guess what? It looks more red. And so... That's kind of a way to kind of cheat, I think. But that accentuates plants, and we want to accentuate fish. Because I think a good-looking fish, and this is my own personal opinion, a good-looking fish makes a uh, planet tank look better. Somehow, if you have the world's prettiest fish, the plants around that fish also look better. So I really focus on the fish. I think a good-looking fish 
sells the rest of the tank. And, you know, I think if you have really good looking plants and you have sick fish or they're all torn up or all beat up, I think I can also ruin the tank. Now, you could have plants that look absolutely terrible and that's going to bring down how good fish look too. So there's a give and take on each end. But I believe truly remarkable fish sell, not sell, but yeah, maybe it's sell, sell the look way more than, you know, a specimen pink flamingo in the corner looks cool, but not as good as the best Congo tetra you've ever seen in person or whatever the best specimen of that is. So, all right. So there's another aspect of lighting that I think a lot of people miss, and that is how bright the light is. Most people, in my opinion, are using too much light. They just buy a light and they crank that thing up to max and they go, look how bright it is, right? And I always use this example. Uh, this is a light that I have dialed. I have two lights here. I've Basically, this is like uh, $2,000 in lighting lighting me right now. And it's, you, it's at about 20%. And so... Why would you spend so much money, $2,000, and only use 20%? Isn't that a waste? Because it gives me the band of light to handle any situation, right? And that's what's important with your aquarium, is just because it can go this, this bright, right? Let's crank this thing up. You're going to watch me. If I'm the fish, this is, you know, you could see this in your aquarium. Like, hey, I'm looking a little blue and washed out. Because now we're reflecting so much light off me, we're reflecting it onto my face. And you just keep going up and up and up and up. You see how the whole background now is fading out? We can do this in our aquariums. You put so much light that all of a sudden it's such a strong beam. We're not noticing the custom background you put in. We're not noticing the plants behind the light. We're not noticing the fish back there. Right? And we just keep going till there's no color left. We've put a, you know, now we're at max. We've put a light so strong on me that we've lost all the color in the room. We've lost the fireplace. We've lost, oh, Corey doesn't have skin tone anymore. It's just bright white. And that's what happens in your aquarium. When you put way too much light on a fish, you basically overexpose a camera trim. You're just going to overexpose way too much light. And you're going to lose all the details. And it's when you come back down to a normal amount of light. And for a lot of us, normal was way too much light. But when you start getting down, you see as I, as I brought it down each step, stuff's coming back. You see the bags under my eyes for not sleeping enough. You can see, oh yeah, there's he, he does have a beard right now. And oh, the fireplace starting to come back. And hey, there's a color gradient on the shade. Right? That's where you start getting the right amount of light. Now, I need to change my lighting based on how bright is it that day, what camera am I using, all of that kind of stuff. You might have a little bit of that going on in your aquarium, right? You might have a window, or lights on or off, you might, uh, the plants are going to grow, they might shade, but most people are running their lights too hot or too much. You should be turning them down. Now they're all, they're they're led by fear for plants, not their fish. We're not we're never afraid. Like is my is my light bright enough for my fish? We don't worry about that. We worry. I don't want to lose my plants, so I'm going to give it a lot of light because plants like like light. True. Fish don't like light. In a perfect world, most fish want to be very dim. They want to be, you know. I don't sit here when I'm in my office working. I don't sit here with all this light. I actually sit here with, usually it's something like this. This is this is what, you know, if I'm a fish, this is my normal kind of habitat is like, eh, something like that maybe. Sometimes it's even this. During the day, it's, it's mostly like this. But at night, it's more like this. But that's, you know, what I prefer. But I'm on the show, right? I'm being looked at. My, my, fish, my fish tank owners are looking at me. And we want to see this. So... If we know the fish want dimmer light, there's also kind of another little phenomenon that goes on. The more dim it is, 
the more the fish needs to color up to impress the females. So the fish will actually put on more color to stand out in darker temperatures. Or not temperatures, but well, kind of dark temperatures of light, but darker, dimmer light. When we have very bright light, you may have noticed this in your tanks. You might notice uh, coolie loaches, ghost knives, um, clown loaches, corridoras, all of these types of bottom dwelling fish stay more reserved and more back. That's because they don't want to be out in the open. Bright light, predators could be dangerous. And so when we lower that light, you might see way different activity out of your fish. Wow, they're so out. A lot of times when you say, oh, so my slush of pearl Daniel has never come out, right? It's a lot of times too, too bright. So I'm not advocating you just don't run lights. What I'm advocating for is play with your lighting a little bit. Can you get away with, you know, I see it all the time. You've basically got Anubias, Cryptocorns, Java Ferns, and a Dwarf Aquarium Lily, and you've got your light cranked up to over 9,000, you could probably turn that thing down to like 50% and you're going to get better coloration out of your fish. You're going to get better behavior out of your fish. You'll also probably grow a little bit less algae. Your plants will grow a little bit slower. That's a true statement. But uh, you're also going to save a little bit of power. And as a bonus, you turn your, your light down, it's going to create less heat in that aquarium. So naturally you're going to get the byproduct of um, better looking fish. So adjust your lighting with intent. Ask yourself, do I actually need 100%? Could I do 80%? Maybe I'll do 80% for three weeks. What does that look like? Right? And over time, what you're going to find, this is what I find in my fish rooms or my fish store, right? When you have a lot of aquariums, you can try different settings. If you have three 20 gallon tanks, you could try one at 100%, one at 80%, one at 60%. Let that go for a month and then look and see well, what, what were the effects. When I lost 20%, hmm, nothing different. Okay, I could save 20% energy and 20% light on my fish. At 60%, ooh, yeah, this plant's struggling. I don't know, maybe it's 70%, right? But once you find it, you can run all of your tanks basically at that and, and know that each tank size is different. So 60% on a 75 gallon tank will be different than 60% with the same light on a 55 or a 40 or a 20. All those are different, but for something we spend so much money on a good quality light and for it being so important too often, it's just put it max. Instead, I would say play with it a bit and find a level that your fish are really outgoing, they're coloring up a little bit more. That's what, th those are my metrics, right? You might go the same for plants. I want them to grow faster. I want them to color up more, but I'm talking about fish. I like fish. I love fish. I, I would say I love fish. I like plants. I love fish. If I couldn't keep any fish, I would not keep aquariums. Even though I'm good at growing plants, I think they're fascinating. There's not enough for me without fish. So I like fish. I love fish like plants. All right, the last thing, last tip, tip number three. <laughs> I just remembered from a long time ago, uno, tuno, and threeno. I haven't done an unboxing in so long, I forgot tuno and threeno exist. Uh, tip number three. Foods are very important, and this is actually what spawned this whole video or this, this podcast and live stream today. This week, I, I kind of just clued in. It's stuck in my brain. I see it all the time, but this one's stuck in my brain, where people were basically, I don't know if bragging is the right word, but they would take a picture of all of their fish foods, and it was almost seen like it's a war chest of like, look, I got... 12 different foods, I got them all, right? And we, we've talked about that in the past of like, just because you own a lot of different foods is not good, right? It, it, to me, it's almost, it's counterintuitive. Like, great, I own every type of aquarium light. That basically just means I have no idea which one's good. 
And it's kind of the same way with, with foods. So I was asking, you know, in the poll, how many fish foods? 54% are feeding, well, you know, are feeding five or more. 16% at four or more, 16 at three or more, and 15% at two or more. Foods are very important to getting your fish to look better. Whether you're trying to put on weight, maybe you need something with a lot of fatty acids and, and fat proteins in there, or fat content, or maybe you're trying to really get color. You really need some reds, right? So you might be feeding something like krill. Or maybe you've got a picky fish that won't eat at all, and you need that krill smell, you need that garlic smell in there. Or maybe you're trying to get yellows out of a fish, and you got to use marigold. It's in koi foods, right? But what I see a lot of people doing is they go, well, I've got a bunch of different foods. If I put all of these different foods in, I'll make sure everybody eats. But you're not making sure everybody eats good things, right? If you have a home and you have everything that the grocery store has and you're trying to eat healthy, odds are, oh, there's a candy bar. Oh, there's some chips, a soda, pizza, tacos. It's all there. You got it all. But how do you ensure that the right fish eats the right thing, right? So I would, I would say... Where do I want to go with this? Because I know the main theme here. I'll pivot a little bit. I think the one of the biggest problems we have as a hobby, we buy foods. We test them. We go, oh, let me put that in. It ate it. All right. I think it's all right. It ate it. Sure. But then maybe we feed another food and we're like, oh, they like that better. We hang on to this food and we go, well, I better use it up. I don't want to lose my money. What I find that we're not doing, though, if you buy food and you eat it and you go, oh, that's terrible. You don't, most people don't force themselves to eat it and go, well, I'll wait till I run out of my good food, right? So imagine you open up a package of food, you eat it, and you don't like it. You pack it back up, you put it back in the fridge and you go, when I run out of the food I do like, I'm then going to eat the stuff I don't like. And the problem with that thinking is, well, now you've got food that might be a month old. It's not getting better. It's only going to get worse, right? And when we have all these open foods, and that's and that's the key thing. When I'm analyzing these pictures, they're open jars and containers of food. And if you have, you know, there's people that have 15 foods sitting there, and they might only have two aquariums. It's going to take them a year to feed all those foods. And every day, most, not all, but most of those foods are getting a little more stale. Maybe a little more rancid, depending on that fat content, depending on is it frozen, is it freeze-dried, is it powdered, is it, you know, like I've, I've had krill pellets that when I used to buy them, they were great. They were actually smushy, but they were so, they had so much moisture and so much oil in them that if you let them sit, even free, not freeze-dried, vacuum-packed in the bag, three months later, you'd see a pool of oil in there and they actually got to a point where i was convinced that some of it was going rancid so i stopped feeding it even though it was kept in the fridge and it was vacuum packed and that was the way i bought it and i believe that freshness on food matters so one thing i, I recommend you do you look at expiration dates when you first buy them right now, here we go. We have, we have freeze-dried, which were sold out of these, by the way. So people liked them. They bought more. They are at retail stores. We have some at our retail store, and the retail partner stores have some. We'll get more in probably, oh, it's a long time, three weeks, at least three or four weeks more. Uh, but there's dates in which things are packaged, right? So this, this was packaged uh, December 25th, 2022. Right, and here we are. They basically arrived February fifth or something. So from the time of manufacturing, it had to take a, a you know a, a cargo container boat to get here. It's about two months. So that's about as fresh as you could possibly buy most foods. 
from the packaging to your doorstep within about two months is the, the freshest you could possibly get. Now, we have a seal on these things that are, you know, it's, it's basically Fort Knox. It's actually kind of obnoxious to get off of there. So it holds freshness really well. But even that, there's a little bit of, of you know, penetration in plastic and that kind of stuff. And so, like, things go bad. That's why there's an expiration date on most things. Now, freeze-dried foods, they've taken out all the moisture. They do hold up really, really, really well. Same with frozen foods. They hold up kind of really, really, really well. But even this has an expiration of two years. So what I recommend is when you're going to buy a food at a store, see how fresh it is. Make sure, because I've, I've had it happen. I don't have any more food sitting around. But I definitely have had it happen where, one, on at local fish stores, I found a food that's already expired on the shelf. So obviously don't buy that. But then I also find foods that are like, this expires in like two months. That means it's already 22 months since it's been manufactured, right? So ideally, you want as close as you can get. Now, does that mean I wouldn't buy it? Not necessarily. If it was the food that I feed, and I feed it quickly, and I'd, I'd, I'd still buy it myself, right? But that doesn't mean that I wouldn't look going, you know, how do I... How do I maybe talk to my local store or find a different source and go, hey, how do I get this fresher? I like this food, but I want it even fresher. So like for us with Extreme, for instance, we buy directly from Extreme. I think most people do. There's, I think, I think they all, I, they might have ditched all their wholesalers, so they might only sell it directly. But for instance, most of ours, we buy from them and we sell it within a month. But there are products we've run to in the past, like... Uh, like Dennerlay Shrimp King Foods comes over from Germany. They make them in huge batches. And when we were getting them, sometimes they would land with less than six months. So we would get them in our warehouse. We look at it and we go, this expires in six months? We're not going to buy from you if you keep sending us product that's this old. It's not that it's not usable. It's that we want to offer our customers the freshest because we know it's the best for the animal. But then also... We don't want to get stuck with it. So if I buy 5,000 units of a fish food and it's only got six months left and I only sell 800 units a month, well, in six months, I'm going to have all these units that are expired. But what you can be doing is focusing on freshness. I think it's a big key. So a couple things. Narrow down the food options. We're going to talk about another aspect of food in a little bit, but narrow down the food options so that you're buying the ones that you need that you can use up within the month for the most part. You know, frozen food can go longer, freeze dry can go longer. If you vacuum pack your food, it can go longer. But, you know, we're talking about the outliers here where I meet people all the time. I buy the five pound thing of Tetra Flake. It lasts me years. And I cringe and I go, oh, Man, okay, there's there's a lot to a lot to learn here. Um, but try to use your food up in a timely manner, right? Just because you can buy a 55 gallon barrel of of mayonnaise from Costco doesn't mean you should, right? Yeah, you save a little bit, and most times we're not even saving that much. That's the big difference. Um, well, in my opinion, you're actually saving nothing because like with our dog food, we can buy like a 50 pound bag. That's like, I don't know, like a hundred and some dollars. We can buy a, a two pound bag, a four pound bag and a 14 pound bag. We buy the 14 pound bag and it lasts us like six weeks. We keep it in a, a sealable container, but really we should do even do a little bit better job, honestly. Even though... We save probably 10 or 15 bucks by buying the much bigger package. That bigger package that's, I think it's 25 pounds or something. Now, all of a sudden, that's going to be three months worth of food. And that three months worth of food, the, the last six weeks of it is just already six weeks stale. And so even though we're saving money, we save physical dollars. So, you know, we, let's say we save $15. We're also not getting 
maybe we lose 15 or 20 percent of the nutrition so if we're really trying to do best by the the fish or the animal we're kind of not in that instance and so that's why we buy the smaller bag even though we know we're going to use it like this our dog's been eating this food for five years right same thing with the fish smaller quantities that you can use up like in a month and usually that means you got to narrow it down a bit because if you buy you know if we buy 15 different dog foods and each bag takes six weeks pretty soon we have over a year worth of foods that's not good so the way where i want to pivot here is how do how do we decide which foods right could be color right color enhancing could be breeding could be extra fatty acids i start with how are they consumed too many people drop food in they go ah they'll eat it by the time the lights go out that's not a good sign that's like saying i served lunch and eventually the family will be so hungry that they'll eat it before we go to bed instead you want that grab and growl mentality of like oh it's taco night oh it's pizza my favorite like whatever that trigger is you want that in your fish you want to be able to feed your fish with that mentality and hit all the levels right so one of the reasons live baby brian is is so good because it triggers that oh my gosh it's taco night mentality right if you've never tried it get yourself a little thing of uh i think i got it right back here get yourself like the six dollar baby brine shrimp or eggs you can hatch it out and i mean you could hatch it out in this water bottle technically get a little bit of salt you could do it no problem try this and get that feeding frenzy because part of it is learning what you know how good can a fish look how much can they love food if you've only ever eaten raw potatoes and you know you're now you're 26 years old and you've only ever eaten raw potatoes and somehow you're still alive you don't get excited about food you don't know that pizza and tacos exist and things like that so when someone says i got the best food and you're just like yeah food it's uh raw potatoes food sucks that's part of my life i don't like once you see how excited fish can get for food you've now got something to measure against and go hey this food also gets them pretty riled up that's why extreme krill flake hikari vibrabites frozen foods these freeze-dried foods like with the freeze-dried you guys like me love the fact you get to see your fish up close and you can see if they're sick you can see if they have torn fins you get to all that that's that's a mode of feeding and i think those are very important when it comes to uh foods so if i throw this on the top right this is brine shrimp and the tube effects worms if i throw these on the top they do really good really good at feeding my hatchet fish right at the top right great however this is gonna be a good example i think okay so if i throw it on top those hatchets love to feed from the top no problem now if i also have celestial pearl danios in the tank and i just throw it on top they will literally not get a single bite they're not going up to the top they don't want to eat from the top they eat mid-water so I take this food and I stick it to the glass mid-water. Now they go nuts. We've got videos of it. They love it. But they won't go to the top, right? What about the bottom dwellers? Now they, some, we have, you know, corridors will come up, but you want a food that they will eat. Live baby brine. Plecos and stuff will eat it. But it tends to get gobbled up by the other fish. So we tend to use wafers and, and sinking pellets and, and other stuff, maybe frozen foods that get to the bottom. The trick here is make sure that the food is eaten with gusto. It's of a decent quality, which most fish foods on the market are. In my opinion, I, hey, I'm now a fish food seller and manufacturer type person now. So now I, maybe it carries a little more weight. There's not that big of a difference. Like... If you can't get our freeze dried and you buy a different freeze dried, it's not that different, right? We're talking about Pizza Hut versus Domino's versus your corner shop. It's all pizza. Slight differences, really. Price points, toppings, deep dish, thin crust, that kind of stuff. But really, at the end of the day, it's some cheese, some sauce, and some bread. 
You can screw it up. You could burn it. But, you know, assuming it's not burnt and all that, they're pretty equal. Most fish foods are that way. We've gotten so good that if you walk into a fish food manufacturer facility, they don't even make bad foods because everybody else already wants a pretty decent food you kind of go, well, we'd have to actually go source the crappy ingredients you want. That would actually cost you more than using what we use every day. So it really becomes mode of feeding. Do the fish that you have like the way you're feeding it? You know, take, take uh, you know, those hatchet fish. If I only put in algae wafers into a tank, even though the first ingredient, fish meal, right? Might have shrimp, might have all the goodness in it. They'll never eat it. They don't eat from the bottom, right? So narrow down to the foods you actually need. How do my fish eat? What is it they need? Do I need to color enhance them? Do I need to put fat on them for egg production? Do I need it to float? Do I need it to sink? Do I need it to be midwater? Condense that as much as you can. So if you need floating and midwater, you could do these freeze dried, for instance, right? Because there's two ways to feed it. Same thing with frozen foods. If you put in a frozen cube right on the surface, it floats till it thaws, right? Just keeps floating and floating and floating. Eventually it thaws and it'll sink. Now, things like freeze dry or frozen cyclops, you throw that in, some will fall off. But eventually that whole cube falls. Now, if you hold it in your hand and you kind of do this move in the water, it'll disperse everywhere. And all the nano fish and everything go nuts for it. That's that's a better way to do it. Take some work, right? So I would I would encourage you, like maybe, maybe. Let me think here. I think the max foods that you want is, I would say four. I'm trying to envision if I have a bunch of tanks. Let me let me let me analyze my foods. Maybe that'll help. On the given daily, right? We have ladybird has to eat frozen clams and stuff. So that one's like that oddball gotta have it. Nothing. I can't I can't go ladybird. Here's free dried foods that'll trim your teeth down. Not gonna happen. So like that oddball has to. No way around that. But then for the most part, the rest of the tanks. They get freeze dry, or not freeze dried, uh, krill flake from extreme. In the feeders, they get the extreme nano pellets. And then outside of that, so that's, I'm up to three. Outside of that, they get frozen bloodworms, because that eel, he'll only eat those that, well, he'll eat frozen bloodworms and frozen brine shrimp, so that's another specialty. Frozen cyclops, so I'm up to five. And then my freeze-dried foods, which I would I would put these like these two kind of substitute for the frozen. Like I'm definitely lowering the amount of frozen I feed now that I have freeze-dried also. So I'm at five, maybe you could clock it at seven for 25 fish tanks. I think I could still pare down though. If I didn't use auto feeders, so like if I didn't have ladybird, so if you don't own a puffer. You go down to six. You don't own an eel that will only eat frozen foods. You can go down to five, right? So you're down to five. And I think I honestly could narrow it down from there to about three, personally. But that being said, I, with 25 tanks, I'm feeding so much that most of these, like a, a container of this food lasts like two to three feedings for me in 25 tanks. That's 75 tanks of food worth, right? So I'm going through stuff so fast, it's not as much of a problem. However, I do know, like I've gotten big 10-pound uh, bags of flake food before, and it gets too stale and and not good by the time I'm done with it. So when I got more of it, I asked for it to be in smaller bags. Help me out there. Um, and I also put them in containers that are resealable that are quite easy. But I try to, I should do a video on it, but I take some food that lasts me a week, maybe two, I put that into a container and I feed out of that. Then the main container of food is sealed up still 
So it, so the main container food gets opened up once every couple weeks. The feeding container gets opened every day, right? And so I'm doing things to manage the food quality. And by doing that, which we've spent a lot of time on foods, by doing that, we're making sure we get enough vitamins to the fish. We're, you know, we're making sure they eat correctly. They get enough. We slowed down the metabolism so that food goes even farther because we lowered the temperature, right? We've lowered the light so that they can be confident to come out and eat. And in three weeks, you're going to notice like, wow, my fish, they got a little more pep in their step, looking a little better, got a little bit less algae, right? And my final plea is if you have foods that... Like, I always feel bad because I'm spending other people's money. But if you have foods that have been open for, I'm going to put, I'm going to go a little bit long on this one. I, I, I can, I hold myself to a, a higher standard here. That turned down, it's getting hot here. If they've been open for three months and they're like in a package sitting at room temperature, I recommend either throwing it out or feeding it to like, like an animal that can eat a lot. So what does that mean, Corey? That means that if I had this and it was sitting out for a long time and uh, I was feeding cluster pearl daniels, let's say, and it was going to take them another three months to finish this. What I'm saying is you take this food and I would go feed it to like my turtles. They would eat this much food in a day. So I would mix it in with their other food and, you know, essentially liquidate it. Or maybe you go feed your worm garden, or maybe you feed your koi, like, oh, my, you know, the koi would eat that in one sitting easy. Um, and replace it with fresher foods. And this time when you replace them, go, hey, I didn't feed that very fast. Should I get a smaller package? Should I divide it out right when I buy it? Should I feed less food so I go through them more often, right? Because naturally, as you slim down, you will be forced, you know, every day you're going to feed your fish. Maybe you're feeding once or twice or whatever. And if you've got 15 foods and you're feeding twice a day, right, that's only, you're still going to have one food every week that didn't even get fed. Whereas if you have three foods and you're feeding twice a day, you're getting those foods you've identified to be the best. Maybe they're best nutrient wise. Maybe they like them the most. Maybe they color up the most. Maybe they're economical for you. They're getting that every single day now. And that's where you're going to get that, uh, that expected growth, the coloration, all of those things. And when you look at fish breeders and things like that, we have phases where we're trying to grow a fish. We have phases where we're trying to color up a fish. We have phases where we're trying to get nutrition that makes them more healthy to a fish because there's different cycles. I need you to grow. I need you to look good. I need you to handle shipping well. Those are all different things. And we can tweak foods a little bit. And if you're watching your fish enough, you might go, ooh, you guys are getting fat. Let me uh, let me back off some of the higher fatty foods and bring in something with some more uh, some more fiber, right? Maybe you're having bloat a lot of times. You know, a lot of times when you're seeing bloat and things like that, it's it can be a rancid food or expired food, things like that. It could also be the wrong food for the fish or, you know, they're eating the wrong food. If you're, you know, if you have African cichlids and you have some predators and you have algae eaters and they're cross eating each other's food you know that that's more of a mix of a fish but you could find foods that'll satisfy both and that's where you see things like hikari excel come into play but those those three factors how hot they are how you're lighting them and how and what you're feeding them those three factors in the next three weeks if you spent you know today working on it, going, okay, let me slim down the foods. What are my freshest ones? What do they like the most? And maybe you got to order some and get that coming in in a couple of days. You mess with the lighting and you go, hey, I'm going to bump it down just two degrees. Let that ride. See how they look in three weeks. You can do it again. You can go, okay, well, let me, I'm going to go down another degree. You know what? After I reduce the foods, turns out they actually, you know, don't like this one as much. I'm going to eliminate that one. 
and the lighting, I'm going to turn down a little bit. Three weeks later, oof, lighting, that needs to go back up. That wasn't a good decision. Heat's where it should be. Food seems dialed in. See where you go. You're going to see better fish in your aquariums from that. And, you know, you're going to get all the other benefits. The, the, the things of, like, less cleaning because you're putting in higher quality food. They won't eat as much because the temperature is a little bit cooler, right? And you have less algae because there is less light. Now, the fourth bonus tip that I'll throw in, once you go through those three weeks and you get stuff looking better, I want you to see if you can test the water each week and see if you couldn't go three weeks without changing water. Because I believe changing water the way most people do it is stressful on their aquariums. Not so much they're dying or anything like that. There is also an equal stress on the other side. If I don't do anything and the fish and the water goes terrible, all my fish are going to die. That is true. But most people, just like we set the light at max, we have all the foods, we set it at 78, we do it because of that's what we do, not out of analysis. And most people, what they find is like, you know what? I don't need to be changing water so often. And when I stop changing water so often, I noticed X, Y, and Z happen. Most of the time, X, Y, and Z are positive things. So... Jennifer said, I changed water yesterday and I have a ton of snails. I hate bladder snails. Well, guess what? Higher quality foods, lower temperatures, lower light. All of those things go towards getting rid of excess snails. There's, there's infinite combinations of things in our aquarium going on. And when we change them, they will change the outcomes. So, for instance, feeding a, a low quality shrimp pellet that puts waste all over your aquarium makes you a lot of snails. Feeding a frozen blood worm that goes in with no waste doesn't make you snails, right? And you can start, you know, if I had that snail problem aquarium, I would look at foods going, what are they eating? What are they not eating? What can I change to help starve out snails if that was my goal? Well, I turn lights down. Maybe I run them not as long. Maybe I don't run them as intense. There's less algae. There will be less snails. I feed a cleaner food that doesn't leave stuff around. Guess what? there will be less snails. I'm changing less water, maybe. Not as much calcium's coming back in. Snail shells are having a harder time. I'll have less snails. You might have the opposite problem. Oh, my snail shells are all pitted and they're, they're doing horrible. Guess what? More foods with calcium. If your tap water has a lot of calcium, maybe more water changes. Maybe you got a low pH. Maybe you need to add crushed coral. There's a million things we can tweak in our aquariums. But I know... Majority of us like a good looking fish. And those are three tips that will make your fish look good. They do affect other things. And I think you guys will see some positive results when you look at it from a standpoint of how do I optimize my one ecosystem? Because so many of us, I've got 25 ecosystems. I'm not going to tell you at all that I, like if I only owned one aquarium and it was Ladybird, that aquarium would be amazing. The fact that I divide my attention over 25 aquariums that's where each one is always worse off for it. So if you get back to not thinking about how, what am I going to change in my fish room or all of my tanks and get back to how am I going to fix this one tank with these fish, you'll do a lot better. You get a lot better results. Slow and steady is going to win that race. So, all right. Let me close the poll. Is that something I can do? Is that... Oh, end the poll. That's what I do. Woo. There's the results. 50% feeding five plus. I'll be interested to see. I would, I would put money that if we did that again in a year, it'll be the exact same poll just because uh, people will come and go. And uh, social media, advertising, everything. We all want to sell a million foods, so. You may have noticed we've been streamlining our website. There's a few less plants. There's a few less foods because I do think it's part of my job to continually um, be your personal shop or help you make good decisions. And so if I see that people aren't buying stuff and or another product we have is selling better that does the same job, 
the more things I can remove from the decision tree, the easier the decisions become. So um, there's always other outlets. So you're always free to buy from other people because there's going to be, I only feed this food and you got rid of it. I get it if that was dialed in for you. But we might go, well, we sold 30,000 packages of food this month. And there's literally some foods where we're like, oh, we sold four. Four. Like, that takes up room in a warehouse. And the, the thing that I want to make sure, I don't want it so if you order these from us, you're like, wow, they're super fresh. And then you order Cichlid Gold Large, and we're selling four a month, and you're going, oh, my gosh, this isn't fresh at all, right? So there is something, I do believe there is something to not just carrying everything all the time because you can't do a good job on everything all the time. So we have to streamline and keep our focus on what's good what's popular and there are things that we get rid of that are good but we don't sell enough and so you know it, it's like if we were we sold pizza and tacos and everyone's 98 percent are buying tacos let's let a pizza specialist go to that restaurant and get the best pizza of your life it's not that we don't think pizza is good it's that our ingredients and everything aren't going to be as fresh as the person that's doing 98% pizza over there. So, in a video a while ago, you mentioned you can have clown killifish, coolie loaches, and scarlet battis in a 10 gallon. How many of each fish would you do? Well, obviously, skill level plays a part of this. If it was me personally, I would probably go with six clown killies, six coolie loaches and maybe one to two scarlet baddest, depending if I could find females. I probably would end up doing some, some shrimp and some snails and some other stuff too, but with those three in particular, that's the numbers I would start with. And if after six months you're going, but clown killies is the coolest thing I've ever seen. I need more, get more. But you probably, you know, if you're really spoiling them, they're probably making some more anyway. You can breed them. Not too, not too difficult, I find, on those guys, which is fun. New members or the gifted members, don't forget to check out the videos and presentations. That's right. They're, we've got over a year's worth. Every month we hire a professional in a field. We have them give a presentation on it, and you guys get to absorb that. It's, it's usually a, an hour to an hour and a half. Could be breeding Corridoras, could be aquascaping, could be medicines, could be uh, electrical current fish, could be uh, shrimp. And we just keep hiring more and more and more. We've got got another one. It's always the third Saturday at 11 a.m., I believe. And uh, we just keep lining them up. That's what we do. Eventually, it's going to be this giant, giant catalog. that, And you can watch them all, right? So for five bucks, you can watch all the ones previous and the one this month. So even if you've never been a member before, for five bucks, you can get all that. You can save 5% on your orders through AquariumCoop.com or our retail partner stores that offer that discount and so sometimes you know you're going to buy something like a light if you sign up for a month you get to watch all that stuff and you save five percent you actually save more money than you'll spend it's kind of a no-brainer uh let's see would it work to build a matten filter as a column in the center of a hex tank you definitely could do that um yeah, there's no real reason why you couldn't do it. You might run into like, oh, it's kind of hard to maintenance or something like that, but everything is doable. You'll probably get some plant roots growing into it, which would be fine if you like that look. Um, yeah, doable. Report back with, oh, you know, this is the problem I didn't like, or, oh, I really did like this. And uh, we'll all learn from you. Is there a good way to get the freeze-dried cubes to sink fast? Uh, no, not really. You can put them in like a, a weighted down basket type thing that we might do a video to show how to make one of those, but freeze-dried foods aren't really made or designed to be sinking. And so we can take a food and make it, we can always make something do what, we should, what it shouldn't do, but we run into resistance, like, ah, oh, it's more work, where it might be like, why not get the frozen version of that or make rapashi food or feed a sinking food? Doable, though. Everything with enough with enough uh, effort, doable. 
Love from Israel, Corey. I definitely want to go back to Israel. There's, uh, I want to visit Ran. He's still got nine more fish farms I haven't visited. I want to visit the one where he breeds a mono shrimp. And uh, he's got... He, the robots that were feeding the fish there were mind-blowing. He's got... I don't know. It's the most advanced farm I've seen. I've been to a decent amount of farms. Not all of them, obviously. But it was like light years ahead of other farms. And so I want to go see the nine other farms they had there. It was very impressive to see some of the things they'd come up with and were doing and the animals were, were great to look at. So, uh, yeah, just gotta, gotta get it planned. That's what I gotta do. Do pink flamingo crypts require more light than the straight Tropica line? I'm not sure they, they actually require more light, but that being said, the way I do it, I'm growing plants and then I put a crypt Tropica or a, a crypt, uh, pink flamingo in and then it's growing. I haven't ever tested, like, well, how low could they both go? But any tank I've personally run, if other crypts are doing well, my pink flamingos did well also. That being said, know that pink flamingo is a cultured variant of Cryptocorn Tropica. So it's the same plant, but been isolated to be more pink. Someone who's way more of a plant nerd would know, but I think it probably just takes the same light, but genetically it's been very, or been chosen to have that, right? So in my mind, my peon brain, just my logical fish room brain, I go, yeah, well, a long fin, you know, does a long fin rosy barb need to eat more food than a normal rosy barb? Like, no, not really. It's just kind of the, it's the same fish with a, a different trait to it, so... Oh, let's see. I need to become a member for the light videos. I don't think we have any light videos under behind the membership thing. You can save money when you buy a light or anything on our, our website, but I don't want to mislead you. I don't believe we have any uh, light experts talking yet. What about your Rapashi, Corey? What about it? I do like Rapashi foods. I like I like really like it when I'm breeding fish because it's water stable for a long time. And, uh, yeah, I, I honestly need to feed it more often. It's, I have a, I finally have a microwave out there in the studio. I just haven't hooked it up yet. It, when I was in my old fish room, I fed it way more often. Um, I just made it in the house more often. I think what's happened, honestly, for me, and it's part of the reason why I've, I've stopped developing as many products is, Every time, like I've got a box of fish food sitting on in my entryway right now. More and more people are like, hey, we want you to test our stuff. We'll give you a great deal, blah, 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 blah. But to actually test stuff, it takes weeks. It's not just like I feed it once and I, I go, okay, yeah, we're going to, we'll get the whole world buying it. It's like, well, I got to test and I got to test and I got to test and I got to test. And pretty soon, that's three weeks of testing of food. And I might go, no, nope, not good. And then it's like, oh, I should be testing this one. Meanwhile, I wish I was feeding the foods I do like. My main foods that I like, honestly, I like extreme krill flake and the nano pellet, the monster or the, the sinking wafers. So I like those three. I like the shrimpy food from them. Um, frozen foods. I like rapashi, but I don't feed it enough. I like vibrabites, but I don't feed it enough. I just, I forget every time I'm at my own warehouse to get more. And then freeze-dried foods, I'm digging quite a bit. And then that might be most. But I know there's probably one or two other things in there where I'm like, yeah, let me let me feed a little bit of this. But I I think I'm, I'm lucky I've got a lot of tanks so I can go through stuff pretty quick. And uh, where... Like, I'll be, maybe that'll be a good thing. I'm setting up the aquarium in our living room, or dining room, I guess. And there's going to be very few foods for that, because it's, you know, out in the studio, I have a dedicated fridge and freezer to fish foods, plus all those tanks. Where in here, there's not going to be a dedicated anything. It's going to be like, well, that's going to live in the normal freezer, so I don't have, like right now in my freezer, I know I have uh, brine shrimp, mysis shrimp, cyclops, bloodworms, normal brine shrimp, clams, shrimp, 
that might be all the frozen food. That's just frozen. So it's, it's, you know, sometimes I need stuff for videos. Sometimes I just got to test. Not that I really need to test frozen foods, but uh, it just depends. Sometimes, oh, I've got Daphne. Like my wife brought Daphne home. I'm like, oh, I'm not really feeding frozen Daphne, but it's still there. Flu ball bug bites have been a good addition to the mix. Flu ball bug bites are decent. Again, I think all foods are pretty much decent. The only thing I don't like about Fluval bug bites is a tripping, and uh, they short us every time. So I go, hey, I need 900 of those. And I go, cool, we got 62 of them. We'll try to get you more before you run out. So we, it's a frustrating thing um, to run into a lot. No Banana says, I use the Keurig to get hot water for Apache. I like that. When I bought this house... I was all stoked because we have a instant hot water thing. And I was like, this, I'm going to make rapashi all the time. And like cup of noodles. Turns out I don't do any of that. We use it to fill water before we boil. I'll make some broth. My wife will use it for some tea. But maybe I should get one of those installed in the fish room. If I had instant hot water, I might do it way more often. That's, I like that. Why well, maybe I don't I don't need the Keurig though. For a while I was thinking the instant uh like kettles or whatever. I used to use that too, but I just need to I just need to get set up for it. That's the thing. I gotta get set up. What eats bladder snails and ram's horns? Uh most loaches, most um puffers, and most turtles. And assassin snails. Yes. So look into those and figure out what makes sense that you'd want to keep. Or if you got a friend that has them, give them to them, trap them. I love, I love it when we get big old groups of snails because well, ladybirds not really going nuts after them lately, but, um, turtles do turtle town. I got a dwarf aquarium lily bulb about a year ago, never sprouted, but it's still solid and not soft to the touch. Should I keep waiting or is it a lost cause? I mean, I kind of feel like it's a lost cause. It's been a long time, but you can, you can try flipping it in the aquarium. The other thing I might try if I was, you know, so let me frame this. I would just spend the money and buy another one because it'd be worth it to me. But if I was on a super tight budget or, or I had a little bit more time, which my time is a thing I don't have, but I might try drying it out for a day or two. You know, just let it sit on the counter or something. And then try putting it back in. Because bulb plants are meant to go through a wet and a dry season. And sometimes you have to do this with like killifish eggs, right? They they have the same process on specifically uh, some of them. And if you kind of wet them, you'll get some to hatch, but not all of them. Then you dry them out again. And then you wet them again, more will hatch. And you might be able to get that bulb to trigger by doing that method. That being said, for like under 10 bucks, you could have another one that probably sprouts in three days. So, does the temperature advice you give to the beginning of the stream apply to German Blue Rams? Uh, it does in a different way. Like, I wouldn't keep them at 72, but you might do some experiments on are you keeping them at 86, 84, 82? Are they wild caught? Are they bred by this breeder? All of those things. Yeah, same with the Pistos. You know, a lot of people will get a German ram or a, a, a wild ram and keep them at the German blue ram temps. <clears throat> They're never that warm in the wild. <clears throat> Same with discus. I like keeping wild discus. I keep them at 76 and they thrive. Whereas a discus out of Malaysia, anything under like 86 and it's falling apart on you. And I don't like keeping discus at 90 because they run so hot. You got to feed them so much and change so much water and nothing else wants to live with it. That it's not a fun time for me. Well, ram's horn snails mess with cherry shrimp. Not really. They'll both cohabitate and breed. They might stockpile on the food, but then they poop it out and shrimp eat it. So I don't find them to be too detrimental. But some people might say, hey, I, I only make, you know, like in my tanks, I might be in a year, maybe it's like I make a thousand cherry shrimp. And if I had a buttload of, Ram's horn snails, I might only make 900 cherry shrimp. And the reality is 900 still a lot. So I, it, I don't. And whether I'm feeding turtles and puffers or I'm selling them, 
it's all it's all gravy. You know, make sure you're breeding pink ram's horn or the leopard spotted ones, and now you're selling them to your local store, and they're selling them, and you could only unload 500 cherry shrimp a year anyway, and so missing 100 is not that bad, and you're unloading shrimp, so it's actually better for you. That's right, I don't drink or like coffee. I tried it. I tried it on Fluball's Dime when we went to Germany and they had a booth and they had uh, like all you can drink and eat thing in their booth, the trade show. I was like, let me try a latte. That one sucks. Let me try it with more milk, more milk. And it eventually got to the point where it was like, pour me a glass of milk and then drop two two drops of coffee in it. And I was like, yeah, that's not coffee, but I, that's drinkable. I wish um because everyone geeks out when we go to peru and there's like fresh coffee beans and and all that kind of stuff and it i love the smell of coffee cannot stand the taste hate that i wish i could because it seems like a almost like a new hobby i could have are there any online retailers who ship frozen foods and would i we've looked into it i don't think it makes sense for us I think uh, Bulk Reef Supply might ship frozen foods, but I think it's like $100 minimum or something like that. Not quite sure. The The logistics of it, it's kind of a pain because to ship frozen foods, you want to use dry ice, which turns it into a hazardous material, which has to ship a completely different way than everything else. And for us, when you buy frozen foods and then you buy a plant and then you buy a light, that already will be three different shipments and it starts getting crazy. We'd have to have dry ice on hand. We'd have to have proper storage before it leaves the building. And all of that to, to sell some frozen. Now, that being said, is there ever a day when we could? Maybe if we were supplying retail partner stores and we had a much bigger building and lots of bandwidth. But it's very low on the priority because there's not a lot of money being made in frozen foods. So... You know, it's, uh, <coughs> I think it'd be a labor of love. Any updates on shipping to Canada? The update is buy from April's Aquarium. We don't plan on shipping to Canada. We have a partner in Canada that is shipping throughout Canada. So April's Aquarium sells our products in Canada. You can order them up today and they ship from Canada to your door. I think it's free shipping above 65 or something like that. Uh, will guppies eat frozen bloodworms? Yeah, usually adult guppies will. Um, when it comes to fry and things like that, I like using Cyclops because it's smaller, Daphnia, um, Baby Brine, any of those. Guppies, even at full grown, they got pretty small mouths. And so while they'll choke down, you know, that giant burrito of a bloodworm, uh, smaller bites aren't a bad thing, so... It, it, it would I, I feed bloodworms if they're like maybe once every few weeks to a, you know just the adult breeders but for the most part it's always smaller stuff or if it was a community tank where you had lots of stuff around if they want to go snag a giant burrito that's fine but i also make sure i feed smaller things because i don't want it to only be that what are some good fake plants for those of us that can't have live plants with our fish I honestly don't think I have a fake plant that I consider to be good. I know the ones that are the best that I that I use when I have to, and those are, I think, the Marine Land bam, fake bamboo, like, three-foot-long ones. But they're terrible. They're chintzy. They're bad. They're overpriced. So I don't have, like, I, I guess I don't have, like, this would be what Aquarium Co-op would do if they were doing fake plants. I'm sure there'll be people that, that uh, you know, raise their hand and be like, I like this silk plant, or I like this, or I like that. I'm not saying that they wouldn't be usable, but I haven't seen anybody put the time and the effort like I would to design the perfect aquarium plant that's fake. I think it's, like, I could I could basically, I wouldn't, because I don't call people, but we could send an email or call them up and go, hey, I'll take the full line of plants. And they'd be here in three months, and they'd be like, look, we have 72 different plants, just like every other company. But they would all be kind of the standard plasticky with a weighted base that basically suck, that get stuck in the gills of fish, get caught in the mouth, all of those kind of things. 
or it'd be the the silk and the metal version and and I think that I think there is space for someone to really spend a couple years and design the best possible aquarium plants and I just don't think anyone's done it yet. The, I will say the best plant that I think I have is the ones I got they're made in Europe uh from that Cichlid place Cichlid uh store I went to but I think 10 of them was literally 250 euros. So they're 25 euros each and they're in the the tank right now but they're they're plastic and they flow and they look very close to Valisneria. The algae's starting to grow on them so they look fairly natural. That being said that's one type of plant. They're you would need an assortment to really do a good job and I think that price point is crazy talk. But being that I have a very expensive turtle and I wanted some extra cover, that was the solution I found because I could not find I didn't I didn't want the chintzier ones and I didn't want to lose my turtle to eating plastic, so Just started my first cherry shrimp colony. Any suggestions on what types of deformities I should try be trying to cull out after I start breeding? Probably none. Just go for color. Most people... Yeah, how do I say this lightly? Most people don't produce good cherry shrimp anyway. Like... Most pictures I see of cherry shrimp, I was like, I would not touch that cherry shrimp with a 10-foot pole. It's There's lots of shrimp that are kind of red. And the reality is cherry shrimp are so good nowadays that they should be like what we used to consider a painted fire red should be the standard these day and age. So with that being said, you're going to cull out an insane amount of shrimp if you're going to that standard. Unless you're starting with that standard, you'd have to cull very few. But for the most part... There's not really deformities in, hey, it's missing a leg, or, oh, it's got a short body, or anything like that. It's just color, you know, and you can all to the standard you want, you know, oh, do all the legs have to be red? Does it have to be, you know, like a painted fire red shell, or are you okay with another type? If you're, you know, using yellows or something, are you going for only the neons, the racer stripe, or are you allowing both? You know, it's a, it's kind of a rabbit hole. You can go down as far as you want. But I maintain all that real people care about is just how red and how good does that shrimp look. That's really, when it comes down to us selling hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shrimp a week, one out of a million people go, ooh, I'm looking for, you know, a little bit. They only want, hey, that one's most red. I want that one. Like so much so when you're like, uh, you haven't picked out any males yet. Like show me a good male with lots of color. I'm like, that's not how that works. And they go, well, I just don't want males then. Like they really, the, the person that's going to consume it only cares about the color. It's why you'll sell a hundred to one cherry shrimp versus a red really shrimp. Everyone just goes, what's wrong with that red really shrimp? That's a normal person. They go, hey, that's like a cherry shrimp, except half is good because it's half clear. So, all right. Um, can you make a decent brine shrimp net? I still use mine from the 80s because all the new ones are terrible. Probably not. I probably won't get around to making a brine shrimp net, is my guess. Maybe. I have a Title 55. Do you think I should put something over the skimmer and the other intake holes? I have a pre-filter on the intake, but the skimmer all of a sudden is giving me anxiety. Yeah, I mean, I personally, if I remember right, that's one of the things I really didn't like, that top surface skimmer. What I might do is not what you should do, but what I might do if I... So I'm a guy that typically, if something's irritating me, I just go buy the solution and be like, oh, I'd buy an AquaClear filter. But you might be the person that goes, no, I don't do that. And if I couldn't go buy an AquaClear filter, what I might do I'm not telling you to do this, but what I might do, I might take that intake out and fill up all of those slots with super glue gel so it couldn't even bring water in. I would basically make it a solid tube. Then it would work like an Aquaclear that I wish I would have bought the first time. And that's essentially what happened. I mean, I ran with the tidal filters. I ran, 
I think we ran 40 of them testing. I hated them. And all of my employees hated them that had to service them. They're like, because we, we literally took AquaClears off. We put title filters on to test them. And unanimously, every employee was like, can we please get the AquaClears back? These are horrible. And I was like, well, and we kept trying to modify them to make them not be horrible. Because they were, at the time, they were willing to give us a great deal to help publicize, you know, make them more popular. I liked that the uh, the plastic wasn't a brittle plastic, and there was some qualities I liked about them. But honestly, I, did, I couldn't, I wasn't going to put my reputation on the line to be like, you guys should buy this thing that I think is terrible, and we're ripping out of our aquariums because my employees can't stand them. So... Would I recommend Aquahuna shrimp? Yes. We buy, make sure it's a true statement. I believe so. We buy all of our shrimp uh, from Aquahuna every week. <clears throat> now, we probably fill in every once in a while somewhere else, but the lion's share of our shrimp come from Aquahuna, and we go through, I don't know, probably like over $1,000 worth every, at wholesale like every week. So, Could co-op sell the brine shrimp sieve? We could. We probably won't, though. We'll probably make our own at some point. I wasn't in love with it. How would you balance and raise GH, KH, and PH in rainwater? Apart from crushed coral, and we can't get wonder shell here in Australia. I would use crushed coral. I know he said don't use crushed coral, but that is the answer. It's kind of like saying... How do you make a cake without flour? It's like, well, I'd use flour. That's what cake is. I also wouldn't use rainwater. But, you know, if you give me the, how would I potentially do it in those specific uh, parameters, which I wouldn't do, but I would use baking soda to alter the pH and the cage. And then I would use something like Seachem Equilibrium uh, to balance the GH. And then once I got it perfect, I would throw it all away and give up fish keeping because that's way too much work. I'm just not willing to do that much work. When you're when you're basically engineering water and water is the biggest resource your aquariums are ever going to use, that turns into a different hobby for me. It's the reason I don't like saltwater tanks because you're engineering water. And so I like to play for the ecosystem and I don't like to play where... I'm just reading water parameters all day long and making tiny adjustments to optimize. If that's your jam, cool. You can uh, do that. But I myself would use crushed coral and put it on autopilot. And I would do infrequent water changes so that the crushed coral has ample time to fix most of that. And then I would supplement... <clears throat> <clears throat> Got a frog in my throat. I would supplement the GH with any type of calcium, honestly. Like I would just... I could use limestone. I could use probably some kind of like plaster of Paris. I, I've made my own wonder shells using plaster of Paris. If you can get that, you can make them yourself. Um, a lot of ways to get there. Can I explain what was terrible about the titles? No, we, we've only got uh, 30 minutes left, and it's like a 17-hour seminar I put on on how to not make a hang on back. There's definitely some other podcasts and live streams where I've gone into detail. I'd have to have one in my hands to fully give you the experience of the raging that I do. But in general, it's a disappointment in that sometimes it's more expensive than a, an AquaClear. It's at least very close in price. And they had so many opportunities to make a great filter. And they had some good ideas, but they missed the mark on so many of them. And, you know, one was even discussed today, like no one needed the surface skimmer. And if you did, you need to make it optional. And it was an option optional. So it just makes no sense when you're in a world of every day, nano tanks and everything become bigger and better. There's more shrimp, there's more nano fish, more people breeding fish, all of that to put in a death trap that's going to suck all that up and kill it with no way around it out the gate. Make it an add-on. Make it, you know, so. And there's other design things, like there's no reason they had to make the basket an odd shape so you could only buy their media. And other choices like that where, you know, 
at this point, hang on back filters have gotten, they're good, right? They've gotten so good that if you're really trying to take over a market, make something that's truly exceptional instead of, yeah, it's another one. That's what it is. It came, yeah, it's another one. It works. It's fine. It's got a motor. It's got water. It's got, it's got media. It'll filter. Everything will. How do I lower my GH? It's really high. Uh, I would probably run a planted tank and not change the water very often. It will consume the minerals out with the plants and you'll run at a, a more moderate GH. That being said, do you even need to lower your GH? Mostly high GH, kind of okay, I find. I've got high, super high GH in my water and I don't have any problems. Some fish, you know, if I was going to breed... <clears throat> giant crebensis that want to be in pH of five and uh, no hardness, you're going to struggle. But everything in my pet store, essentially, you'd walk in and be like, yeah, high GH doesn't care. Never understood how I can hatch out brine shrimp on a daily schedule to feed fry without doing what Dean does using two blenders. How would you do it with one? Uh, I mostly do it with two, but you increase the temperature That'll reach a haster or haster, faster hatch rate. And what happens is like, even at my best, I'm getting them to hatch at like maybe 20, somewhere between like 23 and 26 hours. And so you have this sliding scale or not scale, but sliding hatch time where you start getting them to hatch out at noon, right? So let's say I make the batch at noon, tomorrow it hatches at noon. Oh, great. I set it. So then I got to, I got to drain it. I got to set it up. And now it's, it's 12, 15. And now it's got to go, oh, it's a little bit cooler or whatever. Didn't hatch quite as fast. So it's 1, 15. I harvest them. I got to set it back up. It's now 1, 22. Now I hatch them again and it hatched in 24 hours. Okay. It's 1, 22. And then I got to clean it. Oh, now it's 1, 35, right? Cause I got a little bit distracted or whatever. Or, oh, I had a dentist appointment. I couldn't harvest them until 4 p.m. today. And so now your new time is 4 p.m. So it's kind of always a moving target. And so maybe what you get is, unless you have very, very new fry, like, oh my gosh, they're going to die without a meal today. You end up hatching live brine five to six times out of the week going, ah, I got to, you know, I gotta, I'll set it up tonight. Like in my mind, what I would do sometimes is, Okay, I had a dentist appointment or whatever. I get back, I harvest it, I set it up. It's 6 p.m. And I go, okay, well, I could harvest again at 6 p.m. tomorrow night. Oh, that's not great. I'll just let it go till the following morning at 9 a.m., right? And so I hatch it out, or I, I harvest it at 9 a.m. And then I go, do I really? Yeah, I'll set it back up. And then I'll go, okay, tomorrow I'll get back, I'll hatch it, or I'll, I'll harvest it noon again. I'll get back to close to that noon time. Because maybe that's the time, like during lunch is when I want to feed those fish the live baby brine every day. Where, where Dean does it, he actually feeds brine twice a day, morning and at night, and runs two hatchers to make sure he never misses because he doesn't want to miss, you know, discus fry and that kind of stuff. But that being said, he's been traveling a lot, so he doesn't even doing that a lot anymore. But I think really what's going on is when people say they hatch brine every day, most are, but it's six-ish times a week unless you really get a really controlled environment going with no deviation but we have real lives like oh it's saturday and it's your kid's birthday or you know it's oh i gotta go out to dinner tonight like there's always gonna be real life stuff and so i think when you're hatching brine out a lot you're kind of maxing out at like six-ish times a week you can get runs though where you go for three months straight but there's always gonna be real life I took your advice, uh oh, let's hope it's good, and went with a Senegal Biter with my 12 Longfin Rosie Barbs. The 40 breeder is heavily planted. Are there any foreseeable issues? Um, not really. Like, the Senegal Biter shouldn't get, I mean, outside of you went and got a Senegal Biter and it was full grown already, and then you bought like half inch Rosie Barbs and he was going to eat them, but assuming moderate size, like, oh, I got a. Single biter at like the four inches, which are normally sold. And I got rosy barbs at inch and a half to two inches like they're normally sold. Probably not. You just feed them and enjoy them. Is it bad to not rinse your baby brine shrimp before you feed it? 
I maintain that it's fine. Dean would say, Corey, you're a fool. I rinse it every time. Uh, that being said, I think the marine salt is beneficial to my plants and stuff, and Dean doesn't really run plants. So two different ways of fish keeping, but a lot of times we end up breeding similar fish or the same fish, and, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's detrimental the way I keep fish, but you can... You can, uh, you know, someone asked earlier in the pre-chat, like, how long would it take with the brine shrimp going into a tank to build up? And I, I honestly think it would be like three or more years. Like, so little salt is going in, and that's if you don't have plants. Plants are going to be consuming most of the minerals, so then you just have salt. And if you've never made salt water before, like marine salt water... I think you'd be shocked at how much actual salt goes into like a five gallon bucket of, of salt water. It's like, isn't it two and a half cups or something like that? It's a lot. So to get that much actual salt into an aquarium from feeding baby brine, you'd have to go a really, really long time without ever changing water. And I think most people change enough water that they're never going to run. I've never run to the issue. I'm not saying you couldn't, because I'm sure someone out there is going, no, my grandma did. She never changed water, and she reached it in 14 months, you fool. Like, all right. I don't think most of us are going 14 months. If you run a Wallstad tank, and you're literally never, ever changing water, even though she, I believe, recommends once a year at least, I just, uh, you know, I don't think we're practically going to run into it. Is there a reliable way to raise brine shrimp to adulthood? Yes. If you go to the forum, you can see where I raise brine shrimp in ponds outside. Very easy to do. Um, I, there's even a couple of videos that it's all in a, like a forum post though. But yes, you basically create a saltwater pond. Not too difficult to do. You, you get a pond outside. You fill it with salt water, and uh, you put some eggs in there and then brine shrimp when they're adults they actually give birth to other live brine shrimp so they just keep making more brine shrimp for you when they're happy when they're not happy they lay eggs going oh we're gonna die let's lay eggs so that when we find better conditions we'll hatch out and live to see another day so that is a thing it's it's not a you know it's not a like a huge brine shrimp factory it's enough to feed like if you have i had a hundred gallon pond i could feed like one tank a pretty good healthy feeding of live brine shrimp every single day but it wasn't enough to be like i'm gonna feed the whole fish room i'd need like i don't know a thousand gallon or two thousand gallon pond to do that and it only works in the warmer months right so i in washington i could do it like six to seven months maybe out of the year if i was trying um yeah Do I have any tips for keeping a freshwater tiger moray eel? I don't. I've never kept one. And in general, I, I meet it with ultimate skepticism every time and people go, you're wrong, that every other moray eel has never been truly freshwater. This one might be the exception. I'll wait until I research more and actually see that that is the case. Because so many times in the last 20 years, like, no, this is the this is this is the one and they'll just keep saying that and saying that and saying that and eventually i'll start keeping them and i go yeah but they they do way better with brackish water like every time and so maybe this is the one that would be cool but uh you know the industry has a horrible track record of no this moray eel this is the one and time and time again, stoners find like nope you're eight they're crashing because they actually do want a lot of minerals and salt in the water. So, so yeah, I don't have any other than general tips for feeding a predator fish like that, which is, you know, do a good job, stimulate them, keep them healthy, what we do for all fish. Mm, let's see. Glass worms was sold... Because local fish store is out of black worms, found out they are not worms, and now feel like my guy at the local fish store isn't as knowledgeable as I thought. How quick do I have to use them? Uh, we don't really have glass worms much in the U.S., but uh, 
I know they like to be cooler when they're kept in the fridges, at least in Europe. I don't know how fast you need to feed them, but I definitely, I wouldn't, uh, like if I was selling that or my employee was, I, I would just, I would say they did a fine job. Too often customers are very pushy, I find, of like, you don't have black worms? When are you going to, my fish are going to die without black worms, like especially Oxlado owners. Like the world comes to an end. It's like, you shouldn't have made them dependable on that. And then we go, like, here, these uh, glass worms will be good enough to get you through a pinch. And then the customer, like, they're not actually, they're a different type of annelid. And it's like, okay, sure. Like, for the most part, store owners are going to focus on what they're interested in. And, like, I have never been interested in a glass worm. So I, I would have never researched them. And, like, they're actually a type of larva known as a glass worm. Yeah, what are they a larva for, though? for midges, so midge flies. That being said, I just feel like, yeah, they're fish food. They're like mosquito larvae. And so I don't know what the incubation time is going to be. I would suspect that's why they keep them in uh, like a fridge type scenario so that they don't, their metabolism doesn't mature them to the flies or whatever they're going to become. I don't know if the next step is like land larva or if they just, you know, I don't know. But... For the most part, food, live foods like that at a fish store are kind of, at least in America, you just feed them the day of. Not very many people are trying to keep them multiple days. Black worms a little bit. You, you rinse them and you can a little bit. But in America, we have so much chlorine and chloramine or chloramine in the water that most of the worms die. So, um, but yeah, I would love to actually do lots more glass worms. I think... Maybe contact uh, Twin City Guppies. Didn't they just get glass worms? I'd have to look on their Facebook. Let me see. Hmm. I feel like I just saw a post where they got some. So they might be able to help you with... Oh, I, I messed up. I typed in King Lee, the owner of it, instead of uh, Twin City Guppies. Let's see. Did they just get glass worms? they did they got glass worms so i think that's who i would talk to i would say hey you sell glass worms or or your local store go hey you sell glass worms how long can you have these glass worms before they go bad and then they'll go hey we got them for a week or we got them for three days I want to start a vinegar eel colony, but can't find any starters. That's crazy. There should be. I can't imagine they're that hard to find. It's got to be some like on. Yeah, some on Amazon right here. First, first click. Generic vinegar eel starter culture, fifteen bucks. You could probably find it maybe a little cheaper, some other listing or something like that, but. Amazon, check Aquabid, check, uh, here's some on, I think, Get Gills. Let's see, are they in stock? Uh, yeah, I don't know what the shipping price is, but on getgills.com, they're $4, plus some shipping, I'm sure. Wait, right here. Uh, shipping's going to be $15, so that makes it $19, a little more expensive, but I would wager you could probably find some other cultures because this one says they ship up to, fits up to eight different cultures. I don't know if this seller's got other cultures, but a lot of times that's what I would do is I would just, if each culture is like five bucks, you go, great, I'll take uh, banana worms, I'll take Walter worms, which are kind of the same thing. I'll take some vinegar eels. Oh, and you got some scuds, throw that in the box too. There you go, Twin City Guppies in the chat. He says, yes, we did. Incubation stage is about three weeks, he believes. There you go. That's the good thing about having a network of retail partner stores. It expands our community knowledge because um, a lot of live foods are actually based on location. So it's much more likely to get live adult brine the closer you are to Florida. Um, us being north, they for like 15 years ago, I guess it's more like 20 years ago now, they were really pushing mysis, live mysis. 
it was such a pain to keep alive and everything, but it was coming down out of Canada because we're like bordering Canada, but it was a pain. It was not good for us and it was kind of expensive. And, um, so yeah, depending on where I see on eBay here, you can get uh vinegar eel culture for six ninety nine, and it's free three to four day shipping. So yeah, I would say cultures in general, pretty easy to get a hold of because once you have a culture going, like like I know Dean has them and I might even have some laying around somewhere. But once you have like a gallon of that stuff, you only have to like add an apple and change out a little bit of the vinegar and stuff like once a year. And from that you can make like 500 cultures, right? And so if you take a gallon of it and now you've got 500 things you're selling for six bucks, that's a lot of money. But the reality is like if you listed vinegar, you somewhere you're like, Oh sweet. I'm selling like one or two a day. And now you're making, you know, a trip to the post office or having them do pickup every day for $8. So it's, it works much better. That's a if you're watching the breeding fish for profit type series that we have. That's a, definitely a value add on item. Like, oh, you're buying our guppies, or oh, you're buying this thing. Do you want to buy these cultures as an add on, as opposed to, um, you know, buying it directly just that. But yeah, if you're looking for vinegar eels, seven bucks with shipping. That ain't bad. Crash my microworm so many times. Should try the vinegar eels. Yeah, we used to sell lots of cultures in the store, but you just we would have a lot of them go bad. And what I mean by that is, like with microworms and and that kind of stuff. When you first introduce it, you're like, we're selling tons, and then eventually, like fifty percent of all the people that buy them keep them going for a long time. And so now you get people, the other 50% of people, they like, they get a lazy, like, ah, it's two weeks. I didn't swap out the media. They kind of smelled really bad and died. And then you go, do I want to buy that again? Like, yeah, maybe one more time. But eventually it dwindles down to like, oh, you're selling those worms like once a week. You know, we also used to have uh, someone supplying with like uh, flightless or wingless flies and that kind of stuff. And there's always this big adoption rate and then this drop off. Because at the end of the day, live foods are kind of a pain in the butt. Like harvesting vinegar eels is a little bit time intensive. And they're great if you're breeding fish. But if you could just have a food that comes out of a package or the freezer, it's so much easier and faster. And that's usually what wins in life is what's easier and faster, not so much what's the best. Because the best takes a lot of work. But yes, vinegar eels are great for the lazy breeder. It's a good thing to kind of have in the corner of your fish room going, oh my gosh, I got surprise babies. At least I got some vinegar eels with some work. Um, my local partner store is aware, uh, unaware of the member discount. They're new, so I was thinking maybe it was an education thing. Potentially, they like they get information from us when they become a retail partner store, but not everyone has to be a retail partner. Or I said that wrong. Not everyone has to give a discount. The discount is optional, and that is sortable by our list online. So, um, yeah. Know of any reliable companies to order freshwater shrimp from? Uh, I like Aquahuna. That's who I use. I've also, I ordered my cardinal shrimp from, uh, what is the store? It's one of our retail partner stores in Texas. Um, I have to look it up. I don't remember the name. Let me see if I can find my email real quick. Oh no, where's my email? Oh, I don't even have my email open on this computer. Houston, Texas. Let me, let me look at our store finder. I'll find it in Texas real quick. <laughs> Go to Texas. It was Houston Aqua, I believe, is where I ordered my cardinal shrimp. So I've ordered shrimp from them, and I get a lot of shrimp from Aquahuna as well. Hmm. Is 
So replace online and recommend to buy discus. Nope, I don't have a good, I don't really buy discus, so I don't have uh, good recommendations for that. You know, I've, I've visited some breeders and stuff, but, you know, someone can breed fish really well. It doesn't mean they can ship them well, and I don't have experience uh, with a lot of them, so I don't want to, I don't want to go and make a recommendation and then be like, hey, it wasn't what you said it was going to be. Like, I had never done it, actually, from that company, so... Whatever happened to the red and green pellets, mini pellets we used to sell? Um, I still know the source. We just, uh, back then, we basically stopped packaging our own foods. Now we're working on some foods over time. Um, but we're not in a race. So even though that food, I liked it back then. Now that we're 10 years later, essentially, I would want to make sure it's still a pellet that I'd want to put the brand behind. So we have more options, we have more money, and uh, to be honest, though, that size of floating pellet that's like great for a bed and stuff is, is lower on the priority list. We'd work on a flake food or something first, I think. But I'm trying very hard to not let us become a brand that just becomes the, yeah, us too, Right? And trying to do methodical, I notice this is a hole in the hobby. I want to address this. I want to fix it. I want to make it good. Because easily we could, you know, again, like the plants or the foods, like we snap our fingers and in like two months, they'd be like, look, it's a whole line with aquarium co-op on it. But there's no way I could test the way I'd want to test that extensively. And so we're going real slow about it. And like the amount of foods that I've tested to get to the point where we launched these freeze dried, I don't know, that might've been food number 76. <laughs> like it's every time we find new foods, I test all the time. Like right downstairs right now, I think there's a shipment of like 14 new foods and to test them all takes a long time. Some of them are real easy. Like, nope, this is not good. Fish don't even like it or no nope, price points insane. But we want to make sure that when we bring something to market, we found the best. And now that it's been 10 more years, I'd have to test it again to make sure like, is this still the best? Is it still, that pellet is still made the same way? Does it have the same ingredients? Knowing what I know now with 10 years of knowledge, would I do it better or could I do it better? And so it's kind of back to the drawing board. Every time you learn something new, you go, ooh, should we make this better? Where is Dean gone? I haven't seen him on the co-op video for ages. Well, yesterday he was speaking uh, at a club. So if you were in the group, the Facebook group, you would have seen pictures of that. Uh, he was over at my house last week. We filmed. That'll be coming out in a week or two. Uh, he'll be over here at the studio again on Friday, I think. Thursday? Maybe Thursday. Working on more stuff. Yeah. Not, part of it is... Uh, we don't film every time we're together. Sometimes we're just working on stuff or testing stuff. And, uh, but yeah, he's still, still plenty around. He's just a busy guy. He's got his beach house. His wife lives with him again, which that sounds weird if you don't know the story, but she used to have a job up in Canada that was quite prestigious. She was, I think last year or the year before named like, I don't know, like businesswoman of the year of Canada or something. And so, now, though, they're back in Washington living together, and so they're, you know, they go out. They're, they're active, busy people, I would say, and they got a beach home, and so I, I fit myself in and us in whenever I can, but Dean's still, you know, still got to work on his fish room, and even he's like, I, I've been asking, like, I want to go film. Let's do some more stuff in your fish room. He's like, it's not what I like. It's not where I want it to be, where I guarantee if we walked in, we'd be like, this place is amazing, but it's not a Dean standard. It's Dean minus, like, well... And, he, you know, he's moving moving tanks around, moving fish around, and that kind of stuff. So, you know, I'm not going to press him. We'll get there when we get there. It's uh, meant to be a fun thing and not a uh, stressful thing for him. Is there any, wish, any way I can get koi angelfish from Dean? You can go to our store. We usually have them all the time. But as far as physically buying from Dean, Dean doesn't sell to other people. Or he'll trade. You have to have something he wants. And everyone goes, what do you want? And then Dean goes, nothing. 
Like, you have to have something I don't know that's cool yet, because if it is cool, all of Aquarium Co-op's reach and Dean's reach, we usually get it. So you gotta be like, check this out. You've never seen this, but it's a, like, lime green rainbow fish that you should read, Dean. And he goes, oh, wow, that's super cool. What do you want? I'll trade. Um, but short of that, you know, he, he doesn't really do it because he doesn't have time, so... Mm. Dean's not been on a live for some time. Yeah, I mean, we go live on Sundays, right? Dean's probably out to brunch with his wife and family. Like, just because his family is, like, more in town all the time now, Dean does normal life stuff. So, short of uh, changing the time and all of that, yeah. Reading Parson comments. Changing water, my valve's purling like crazy with no O2. Yeah, when you change water, you get a lot of gas and off. I had a lot of dwarf sedentaria purling yesterday with no CO2 injection. Should probably make a video of it. I always feel like I'm in this eternal struggle to convince people that you can grow plants amazingly well without having to inject CO2, but then also knowing like injecting CO2 does make that easier. So it's this weird, you know, kind of telling you don't use CO2 and then also like, well, yeah, but do use CO2 if you want to be easier. Like maybe it's kind of like, uh, you know, maybe it's something weird like telling people, working out you don't lose weight you lose weight by managing your diet but it's like yeah but working out does burn more calories and therefore does help you lose weight but the way you know obviously if you work out but you eat stupid you're not going to lose weight um kind of co2 same thing like you can definitely get there without using co2 but using co2 makes it easier and it does help but doesn't have to be done that way nuances i guess Can I cut and replant Val Runners? My Val is sending runners into rocks in the hardscape. Yeah, just give it a little trim, plant it, and uh, you could also just pick it up. You know, and I, I'm doing this move because it'll be like, here's a plant, here's a plant, here's a plant, here's a plant, and roots. You can kind of pick it up and kind of move it and plant it back down. You can control which way it'll grow. So you can do that too. You could also just like the one that's trying to go into the wall or the roots, you could go, and we're going to make a turn and make you go back this way. Do we have any requirements of our RPP stores to keep stuff in stock? There's one in area that ran out of something really quick. I said I'll just wait for the next shipment. Guy said it might be a while. No, nope, we don't have any requirements. It's kind of an impossible thing. Like, it might be a while because they might be struggling or they might hate us or, you know, we do have a minimum to buy, but we don't require anyone because just because. Like, I'm trying to think of a good example. Imagine uh, imagine we sell to a store and they focus on African cichlids. And they... I'm trying to think of a product that would be bad for African cichlids. Like, um, let's say it's our nano net. Right? And they bought three. And then the three, like, guppy customers bought them all. And then they're not going to place another order for a bunch of them because that's not their target clientele. So we don't come in and we, t we don't tell people RPP stores what they have to stock or how much they have to. We do have guidance of like, by the way, these are our best selling products. If we watch someone walk into a bad situation, we, we definitely go, are you sure you'd only like to buy one bottle of easy green and root tabs? Cause they're, they're going to sell really fast and well. And if they, you know, come back with, oh, we're sure. Then we go, okay, no worries, right? So we do help with guidance. But, uh, you know, for all we know, I don't know what product it was, but maybe they're going, you know, let, let's say it's, and I have no idea, but let's say it's these freeze-dried brine shrimp cubes. Maybe they brought in like five and they sold out, but they might have 500 of Hikari's brine shrimp cubes that they got to sell through. And so maybe they're going, 
well, we're not buying more Aquarium Co-op ones until uh, we sell out of these because we'll never get our money back otherwise. Who knows? You never know. So, no, we don't force them. We can only make... Well, I shouldn't say we can't. Oh, we can. We only make recommendations if they ask. And uh, we do have like a... When they sign up, we go, hey, here's what we found to do really well for other stores and do well for us. It's in our best interest to help them try and make a ton of money. And we do that, but we never know their situation. So... You know, it, it's it's weird. You know, I watch people do weird things all the time where they buy, you know, like, oh, we're going to buy two of each light. And I'm going, but that doesn't make any sense. You know, we try to advise them, like, you will sell more two foot and 36 inch lights than you will, like, 12 inch lights. You know, like, we just, from buying patterns, you know, People that have a six foot tank, they buy two 36 inch lights, right? And so when you buy two 36 inch lights, those lights can handle 40 breeders, they can handle 65 gallon talls, and they also handle 125 gallon, 180 gallon, 150 gallon, 210 gallon. And so it's kind of like you realize you're buying two lights, but for most of those tanks I just listed, two lights is one tank. And so we'd be telling them like, yeah, I get it. You're going to buy two four foot lights, but you should be buying in that same vein for every two four footers, you should buy four 36 inch lights. It seems counterintuitive, but we have aggregate data of insane amounts of sales. So sometimes, you know, but maybe they know, oh, we only sell 40 breeders. And so it's going to be one for one. We can never know the local knowledge or maybe they're pre-selling them and they go, that's all people ordered. So we we can give guidance, but we don't force anyone to do anything. They Technically, they can go, we'll never sell these green. It's fine with us. You don't have to, I guess. They can, because the, the alternative is you can always come buy it from us, right? So if the store says, I'm not going to carry it, or it's going to take years for us to order it, you can order it from us. But it's usually in their best interest to keep most things in stock. And I think most stores will. And they're trying their best. You never know what's going on. Like, if you're a store in Texas, for instance, like power outages and stuff, like, oh, well, we had bad sales. Or if you're in a in a state with lots of snow and it's, you're having to close a lot. Like, I know a Twin City Guppies, he's in a mall. And if it snows enough, they just close the mall. He doesn't even get a choice. It's not like he can be open. And so there's extra stuff that we won't know all the intricacies of each business. But we can we can try and offer assistance as best we can. can. Shout out to my local fish store, Ocean Design, who finally is a local partner and the only one in the entire city of Chicago. Congrats to them. Hopefully you support them well and they will reap the benefits of the aquarium co-op. <laughs> I've now started a YouTube channel. I was wondering if you had any advice for someone new. My advice would be don't. That's not me trying to keep you down. I would tell you just launch on Facebook and put everything you can into Facebook because if you're on YouTube now and you want to actually make videos that help people, you can't. You basically have to make shorts. YouTube has positioned itself at least so far this year that if you're not making YouTube shorts, you will not grow. It's just the way the algorithm works. And so if your goal is to help people, go on Facebook. We, we're we there with our group. We're there with our videos and stuff. I'm sure give it a few more months or a year or something and YouTube will pivot. You know, things will happen in the, the space like TikTok gets banned or even TikTok and Instagram have realized short videos aren't the best. And so that's why TikTok and Instagram, you can now do vertical videos up to 10 and 15 minutes. So we need the landscape to change. But right now, if I was starting up tomorrow, all in on Facebook, three months from now, maybe I got a different answer. But my best advice to you is don't even compete on YouTube. Go straight to Facebook. Your competition, you'll go from like, there's 10,000 fish channels to compete with on, on YouTube. You go over to Facebook and you're like, oh, there's seven, literally seven, right? And that doesn't count people that are just like, I share my YouTube videos over here. I'm talking people that actually are uploading natively and putting effort into their brand 
on uh, Facebook for fish. The fish industry, it's a tiny number that are actually putting in effort. There's lots of people that go, well, I have some stuff sitting over there and it does some stuff, but you know, like us, we have moderators over there. We're actively creating content. We put time and energy into it every single day because that's where it's at right now. We also do it on YouTube because we're already towards the top of the pile. But if I was starting from zero today, I would just go, yep, and we're just going to avoid that one for now and wait for something to change where it makes sense. Do people watch YouTube shorts? Yes. More people watched YouTube shorts on our channel than everything else this month. I think we had, you know, if I look at the data, we probably, I'll, I'll tell you the exact data right now in case anybody actually cares. For YouTube shorts, let's go to content here or analytics. So in the last 28 days, we've gotten 8.4 million views. That sounds impressive, right? But uh, if we go to content types, right? For shorts, 6.7 million of those views were from shorts. Of the videos we make, so that's the actual normal videos, 1.4 million. And of live streams, 256,000. So really, if I was, if my goal was only like YouTube revenue and getting subscribers and stuff, should not do any live streams at all and get my Sundays back. And really shouldn't even be doing videos, just shorts from the way that they uh, are currently prioritizing. Uh, and in this, in this uh, last 28 days, we did four live streams. We did six shorts and we did five videos. Well, that's actually five live streams because there's a member only stream as well. And when it comes to subscribers, right? So for subscribers, the shorts brought in 12.8 thousand subscribers. All of the videos brought in 4.2 thousand. Live streams brought in, are you ready for it? 234. <laughs> so don't gain too many people from the live streams. People, people don't go, ooh, yeah, that two hour content. I like it, not very often. Instead, we hook you with a video or something, and after a couple of years, you go, maybe I will listen to this guy for a couple hours. And then uh, posts that we make, you know, so like community posts, that brought us 73 new subscribers. So, and uh, if we're looking at the whole picture, really, we should only be doing shorts, but I remain committed to teaching. I only want to teach people things or help, and it's Real difficult to do in a short, not impossible, but it's easier to do in a live stream, have a long conversation back and forth. You know, you're tuned in, that's better, and videos. So not every video is always 100% teaching. Sometimes kind of having some fun with Dean, but in general, my overall ethos is on social media, we're here to advertise, buy our crap, and we'll teach you. That's our goal. So if we teach you stuff, hopefully you buy our crap. It's a win-win. Much harder to do. Like, I don't like that value proposition with shorts as much. Like, yeah, I could teach you how to feed this food in a short. But, you know, my three tips, for instance, took an hour today. That's that's uh, 60 different shorts. No one's following that. People have short attention spans. Mm, no, I, I, I think we all used to think that, but the reality is, imagine, um, imagine I'm a store and I sell cheeseburgers and, and chicken sandwiches, right? And you've been buying cheeseburgers from us for 10 years. And now I start raising the price on, uh, cheeseburgers and lowering the price on chicken sandwiches on all the promotion, I start promoting chicken sandwiches, but not cheeseburgers. And I keep doing those types of things over and over and over and over and over again, right? Eventually, you start going, man, people really like chicken sandwiches. Because every looking at every other person sitting here eating a chicken sandwich. And when you look at it and you go, 
Oh, chicken sandwiches are a dollar and cheeseburgers are twenty dollars. Oh, and every chicken sandwich you buy, you get five free. That's not actually the real data. It's just skewed. And and the same thing is actually happening in um in the shorts. Like on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok, there's bonuses. So if I upload a short, like right now, I know, and they're ending this program now because running out of money because of the economy. But there was up to $8,000 bonus every month if you uploaded shorts. So they were incentivizing the creator. Go upload shorts. We'll pay you way more money to do that. Right? And YouTube is doing that with upload shorts. We will force it down people's throats, whether they like it or not. We'll make changes to the app and the algorithm and these things. And so it's not that necessarily people only have short attention spans, it's mostly, it's more like a chicken and the egg. Like with enough forcing, people are forced to watch it. And then the meta evolves and, and stuff keeps going and blah, blah, blah. And so I think at the, you know, as I talk to other creators and other people, the thing that's remained true over time, the last hundred years, good quality content at any length wins a great two-hour movie a great four-hour movie a great 20-minute friends episode a great seinfeld episode a great super bowl commercial a great short a great live stream a great good content at any length is good content and we do see that there's there's going to be people that love great content by reading in a newspaper, great content by reading it in a book, great content with an audio book, great for listening to music, great for a podcast, great for, there's people on all different spectrums and we're all a complex version of it. I listen to podcasts when I'm driving, right? I don't watch shorts when I'm driving. I pretty much never watch shorts, but Maybe I would watch shorts if I had a normal job and I had a 10 minute break and I was inside Costco and it took me five, you know, three minutes to get outside to sit, taking a drink, sitting there watching four or five different shorts. Ugh, I got three minutes. I got to walk back to the clocking clock. Maybe that's what I do. Right. But then that person gets a different job and now they're at a desk job and maybe they're watching live streams. Maybe they're watching long form videos. And so I think it's a lot more nuanced than, ah, people don't have attention spans. I think that's what we thought, but I actually think now it's a chicken and the egg thing of, well, people are going to like what they're, you know, if you've never been exposed, like the person at the beginning of the chat never had a taco in their life. They don't love tacos because they've never had one, right? And if you get fed shorts all the time, you've never had a two-hour podcast, how would you know if you liked it? You never experienced it yet. So I do think there's some some outside factors going on and uh but i would i would go on youtube or i mean i would go on facebook right now if i was starting today who knows about tomorrow story is always a king audio quality is queen mm, no I, I think audio is king you could like you can sit down with another human and if you tell a good story with good audio as in you're kind of animated and you have voice inflections and you don't stutter and you don't say um and ah and, and you can just tell a story because you've lived it, I think that does better than the visual. Whereas if I could act out an entire story but you have no audio to it at all, I think it won't be as good. Um, but yes, both are important. And in general, good things are good. It's such a simple statement of like, Make something good and it will do well, right? That's just how the world works. <laughs> yeah, I never had a taco that person hasn't lived. I know, it's crazy. Corey and Co-op in Europe and UK, we don't have any, any stores or anything there. I will be in Europe though. Uh, I just bought tickets last night. I think I'm there for three weeks in August, so... I know, I think the plan is to do some stuff in Germany, visit Croatia and Albania and wherever else we, I, I think there's a, uh, 
a place, a store I want to visit, visit, I think it's in Bavaria. So still planning on where we're actually going to go, but I got three weeks to kind of meander around uh, Europe and film for you guys. That's my plan. There's still lots of places I want to visit that I didn't get to last time. And so going during the summer so we can do a little more outside nature stuff and it's not freezing cold, it'll be nice and warm. So the plan is to travel with Chris Luke up the Shrimp King and Oliver Knott, aquascaping extraordinaire. And, uh, you know, not three weeks all together, but Chris and I are together for three weeks, maybe Oliver not with us for like a week. And, uh, yeah. Shorts are up to 60 seconds now. That extra time helps where you can get some great information. Yeah, that's evolution, right? Shorts, when they started, only 15 seconds. Now they're up to 60 seconds. Uh, Facebook kind of did the same thing. 15 seconds, then went to a minute, then they went to three minutes. Now they're at 10 minutes. TikTok is now up to 15 minutes. And what they're finding, so what they basically found, if I'm breaking it down for you guys, is that the content that exists at 15, 30 seconds at a, at a minute, no advertiser wants to advertise on it. Because just in general, the the quality of what the visuals are and, the, and what comes together didn't make Ford want to be like, yeah, they want to buy a truck, right? But like the, so a good thing for you guys to know is the ads that'll be on this live stream will pay way more than what's on a video. And a video will pay way more than what's on a, on a, a short, right? So maybe I can, does my revenue get broken out like that? Can I tell you guys what we made? I don't know if it's. Hmm. I don't know if it's. Wait, maybe here. Yeah. So all the videos. So even though we only release a video every week, right? Obviously, we have like a thousand videos over the years. Been on YouTube 10 years. So all those views, the 1.6 million or whatever that number was. Pays us seven thousand seven thousand six hundred thirty dollars. Then you got the live stream, right? It only got two hundred fifty-six thousand views. You're going, that's not many at all. One point four million versus quarter million. Well, the quarter million on the live stream paid us four thousand seven hundred thirty-five dollars. Not bad, right? And then you go to shorts. We had six point what was it? Six point seven million in shorts. Four hundred dollars. <laughs> so it's it's literally just like ah, there's not even like money there. So for every thousand views on a on a short, it's six cents. So if a, if you watch a thousand shorts over this month, you will have earned creators six cents. So there's no 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 advertisers want a part of that. They're just like ah, just not even not even a thing. But they know that. The demographic that watches a live stream, for instance, they're much more likely to buy. So when you just watch a random video, maybe they're just looking how to fix, how to change a tire on their car or something, right? Different demographics. So, and then we've got you guys. You guys being the member sponsors, you're you're actually what's making stuff happen. You guys, 13,000. So you trump everything else, right? That's what I love about it. I love the fact that I am here to educate you guys. And I know you guys are taking care of us and helping us do things. Whether or not YouTube decides, well, we're going to push this or push that this year or whatever. You guys are here. That's what we like. And so we try and do a good job. At least you grow your subscribers. Yes, that is the benefit from shorts is it grows subscribers. What we don't know is they haven't really given us good optics. Do those subscribers on shorts, do they actually make the journey and start watching videos? Will they actually start buying from us? Will they watch live streams? We have no idea. Or are they only sitting there waiting for the next short? Don't know. Don't have good optics. So I like to I like to hope that if I teach you something in a minute, you might watch a 10 minute video and go, Ooh, wow, I learned more. And then maybe at some point you go, Ooh, I want to learn even more and get to watching a two hour video in a perfect world. Who knows? 
Croatia, the homeland of my family, make sure to visit Dubrovnik and read about Ragusa before you have before if you have time. All right. I'm, I honestly don't know if I'll have time, but I will, I will see what I can do. My biggest issue from the short videos on YouTube and Facebook is that they're all suffering from vertical video syndrome. I actually believe I thought this years ago and we actually we actually tried this and you guys thought I was an idiot. Vertical video, I believe will dominate here going forward. I actually think what we're going to see is that vertical video will take over all video forms outside of movie theaters and TVs. Now, I realize most people go, no, -uh, I don't like it. Mm -mm, that ain't how it's going to be. And I will tell you, yes, current day, that is correct. But when more creators get good cameras and they learn how to film vertically and put on a good presentation and your phone can be vertical and there's more phones that are getting bigger and more like already for website sales, it's like 80%, 80% of people buy from their phone as opposed to a desktop computer. And for someone like me who is a desktop computer guy or a laptop, I'm just going, there's no way that's real. But if you look at society, so we, we posted that we're hiring a part-time customer service rep. There were people that don't own laptops. They don't own computers. They only own a phone. There's people that don't have internet. They only have internet through their phone. I think more and more, we're going to see more of that. And so, you know, maybe I'm wrong and call me dumb in five years, but I do think vertical video will trump everything else because it works so much better on the devices that are in everybody's pocket. I don't think we've learned how to optimize it yet. I think apps can get better. I think creators can get better at framing the video and all of that and and uh, optimizing audio to come out of a cell phone, which, you know, what's, what I find very interesting is a lot of times when we're working with an editor, they'll be wearing an $800 pair of headphones. These are only like a hundred bucks or whatever, but they'll be wearing an $800 pair of headphones and they'll be like, it's perfect. And then I'll proof the video on a cell phone. I'm like, it sounds terrible. I'm sure you guys run to that all the time where it's like, I you play it in, you know, use CarPlay on your, your car and you're like, I got to crank this thing all the way up to be able to hear it, right? And that's because it's being edited by someone with way too expensive headphones, very sensitive, doesn't have to be that loud. They're not factoring in road noise and all these other things. And so I think as everything starts adopting vertical video more and more like I would wager. I haven't tested this yet, but I would wager I could do this whole live stream podcast vertical and it wouldn't make a difference to most people at all. They're just listening, maybe actually on a podcast uh, app or they're driving or you're across the room working on your aquarium, right? Or you're on a screen while you're doing some work. There's not exactly a lot going on with the hands and all that kind of stuff anyway in a podcast. So it could definitely be vertical. And I think for some people, if you're watching on a phone right now, right? If you're watching on a phone, it actually would be better vertical because you would see more of me. Now, what YouTube hasn't gotten right, and I this is why I say apps got to come around because I've, I've done testing with vertical video. They haven't got a good overlay for reading comments or chat. With horizontal video, so a horizontal video at the top of the screen, right? You get all that room to do that. That's why most of us are doing it this way. We want to read comments. We want to multitask. This guy's an idiot. I need to fight with this guy in the comments. Ooh, that's a tip, blah, blah, blah. But if that overlay was really kind of nice over a vertical video, we, we would, most of us would prefer. And I get it. There's a lot of people that say, oh, I only watch in landscape and that kind of stuff. Well, I think with the right UI and everything that isn't here yet, that that tune will change. And all of us, I, I'm, I'm now old enough, I'm turning 40 this year, to know at one point in my life, I was Android only. You'd have to be a fool to buy iPhone. To now I'm an iPhone guy. To now I could be anything guy. But 
you get comfortable in a lane and you can't see how it would change. And then one day it has changed and you know, you're just like, huh, I, I'm actually just having a hard time remembering what life was like before that. Right. A lot of us probably watching right now might've been alive before we had internet, but there's also a lot of people watching right now that have never known a life without internet. I remember not having a cell phone. I remember having pagers. And so over time, these things that seem impossible actually just become a, you know, they just become a normal thing. Yeah. So if yeah, if you're vertical, how do you see chat? You can't. It's a limitation right now. But once they, you know, once they kind of make that better, more people will adopt it. So sometimes it's technology. Sometimes it's people. Sometimes it's, you know, experimenting. When those things start lining up is when we truly get change. And, uh, you know, if all phones become kind of folding phones where they're much more wide like an iPad, maybe horizontal video will win. But if we all keep buying phones that are mostly like this, like if 95% of Americans or the world have a cell phone, a smartphone in their pocket, and most, like even, even my cell phone thing I have right here, it's kind of made to do this. Like, yeah, it can do this, but it just kind of feels wrong. Especially in a car, mostly they're vertical. Not always, but, you know, we'll see where it goes. Remember fax machines? That's right. I actually just ordered a scanner that has built-in fax capability because, man, is it a nightmare when I actually need to fax something. Ugh, I hate having to go to, like, a Kinko's. All right. I need to call it. <laughs> Apparently it's 2.30, and I didn't even notice till it was 2.21. And uh, so we're... We're going a little long on this one with the, the vertical video, but mark my words, vertical video is going to win. I'm sure we'll be extinguished by then. Like, you know, the algorithm won't want whatever Aquarium Co-op's doing. And um, I'm willing to do some shorts, but I got to educate. And that's way harder than not educating. But I believe I'm only interested in trying to help. So... If I can educate, even if it's a little fun fact, that's still better than, I don't know, like pranking people or something. I just, I don't, I don't see the value in that. Not that a good laugh is not valuable. I just don't want to focus my career on that. So, hey. All right. Um, I will see you guys next Sunday. Guys, gals, everybody in between. See you next Sunday. And, uh... Yeah, make sure you compliment someone. I know I compliment at least a couple people this week because they actually had some really cool stuff going on. I hang out in the the Facebook group and the forums every day, a little bit of time, and uh, hopefully you guys will too. There's more and more people, like the Shrimp King's been hanging out there a lot lately. Oliver Knott's been posted in there. Dean posted in there. What I like about Facebook is subtly it, it lets people be a part of it and uh, at their own pace. So you could... You could be all in on the Facebook group tomorrow and then ditch it for five years and then come back for three days. Anything you want. It's not a, you know, not not like the algorithm is not so much like YouTube where, oh, you didn't watch us for a week. Well, we'll never show you again and you won't get a notification. So I do like those parts, but I still like making videos. Still like hanging out with you guys. Still like hearing your feedback. By the way, I've been meaning to say this for like two or three weeks. When I was talking about Velvet a few weeks ago, someone said, Turn the light out because it's photo, is it foot, not photosynthetic, photo, whatever it is. Velvet needs a uh, light to grow and replicate. And I knew that. I did turn the light out and I used salt and crossed my fingers. I might have gotten it. it. took like a week, but I may have, it may, that may be the double, the double, uh, the double whammy there is taking the light out plus the salt. I'm still holding my breath though because velvet comes back to bite me in the butt too often but if if i if i win and then we can replicate it a bunch at the store i'll be sure to tell you you guys exactly how we do it we do this many days without light with this much salt is working if it doesn't then hey you'll never hear it about it again but uh i just wanted to wanted to give the kudos to whoever mentioned that last time i get feedback from you guys and i try it out and it helps me too so uh 
I read a lot of stuff. I don't always respond to everything, but I read a ton and I reflect on a lot of like, you're right. I am a butthole. Oh yeah. I could have done that better. Oh yeah. That, you know, so, all right. Spending time with grandma. Thanks for hanging out. Tell someone they got an awesome tank this week and uh, we'll see you next week, hopefully. And uh, if I, if I get out of short this week, maybe we'll go viral. Who knows? Or I just won't do it. And, uh, you know, I've, I I did six last month and I've done none for like two weeks. So we'll see how that goes.